Good morning. It is a blessing that we have this privilege to come and study the Word of God this morning. And I am looking forward to our study this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. If we can have our things to write with, our pen, I pray we brought pen and paper as we get ready to come together. All right. Would you need to pass by? Thank you. I, I think, I think, I, I think the lights will be off. Just the natural light will be good. Natural light. Yeah, that light. That's good. That's good. All right. Let's start with a word of prayer as we get ready to study. Do you, are you ready to study? Yes. My, my heart, my, my, my blood is already flowing. I want to study. And we have some time to take it slow. And we're not going to necessarily study what we've been studying in the series. We actually, I was told that you want to know how to study the Bible. And so we're going to take the time, not necessarily studying just the details of it, but we need to go back and find out how do I study the Bible. I've always wanted to know that. I remember hating the Bible. I remember not loving the Bible. I remember looking at the Bible and wondering how in the world could someone understand what the Bible says. But then I remember what it was like to come in contact with Jesus and to have him open up the word of God. So our study this morning is we want to entitle it, How Readest Thou? Who said that? Anybody know the, who said those words? Jesus. And so we're going to actually take a look at Jesus, how he studied, what he told us to do in studying. And we're going to have uh, oppor uh, <clears throat> opportunity to be able to ask questions. So if you have any questions concerning this, we're going to take it slow and we're going to make it very simple. In fact, this is not an advanced course of what we're studying this morning. These are simple instructions on how to study the Bible. Very simple. I, I like it simple. Do you like it simple? Inspiration says that the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. So we're going to be studying how to study the Bible very simply. And I, I hope I have time to really make it plain that if anyone needs to understand this, it's the common people. People who sit in the pews, not just simply the pastor, but we're going to find out that if you can understand this as a common person, that God can use us to cause a revival and a reformation. Let's stop and pray this morning. Would you reverently kneel with me? Oh, Father, which art in heaven, we're so thankful for the privilege of being called your children, that thou who makes wars to cease that thou who breaks the bow and the spear in sunder, that thou who is the creator of heaven and earth, that thou can come into our hearts and allow the battle of sin to be over and to overcome through Jesus Christ. Help us to understand this morning how to study the word of God. This is one of the essentials of how to get this experience where we can be a part of your team to finish the work. Make it plain this morning in simple language how to study so that we can get an experience with Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit, for we can do nothing without you. Now abide with us, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Now you did bring pen and paper, amen? amen. Good. You brought your Bibles. In. No need to study the Bible without a Bible. <laughs> We've got to have a Bible. We're going to study the Bible. Now I want to start off with a story. And then we'll get a little bit deeper. If you'll take to Luke, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke. Luke, the 10th chapter, Luke chapter 10. We want to notice what the Bible says. You're going to go to Luke 10 and just hold your thumb there or hold your hand there in Luke chapter 10. We're studying how to read a style. Now, just last week, I believe it was, we had just come back from a meeting, doing some meetings in another place. And when we got back, we went into a store. We got into the store. And there were two sisters, two young ladies that approached my wife just as we were uh, getting ready to make some purchases and go out of the store. And she was dressed. She looked at my wife and she said, I like the earmuffs you had on. It's not like in California. It wasn't uh, so warm there. You don't need an earmuff here. <laughs> but we need earmuffs there. So they, she had the earmuffs on. And she said, I like them. They look nice. And she started talking with her. But, but as she started talking, my wife picked up and recognized that this was a missionary for another denomination, another church. And so the uh, particular missionary said, as they began to talk, would you mind if we were to come and study the word of God with you? 
And so we said, fine, we would love for you to come and study the Word of God with us. So we invited them to our house. And they came. They were members of the Mormon Church, the Church of Latter-day Saints. You have Mormons here. In fact, if you study early on the history of Redlands, uh, it was uh, Mormon territory and for a while and uh, so forth. But that's, that's your history. We won't talk about that right now. Anyway, we uh, visited with them. We set up a time for them to come over. They came over the, the very next day. There was a little storm uh, that stopped us. We were supposed to do another meeting, but there was another storm uh, planning meeting, and a storm stopped that, and so we had free time, and we let them come over. They came into the house, and the two sisters brought an older uh, sister with them, an older lady with them that was leading out, but she was kind of watching as they were practicing the missionary work. They sat down, and one of the first things that's interesting, I, knew, I normally always said that a Mormon would bring out Joseph Smith on the third study. I had to revise that. Uh, they brought him out on the first study. <laughs> but we sat down there. We had our Bibles, my wife, I, and my daughter. And they came in the house, and they saw us with our Bibles. And they, they normally were trying to get into, uh, you know, how can we get to the Bible study, talk about small talk. But they saw the Bibles out, so eventually they said, they started going to the Word of God and started saying there's going to be a famine in the land. They took us to Amos. They took us to these various places, uh, maybe two texts. And then they said, and this is why we need to study the Book of Mormons. And they took out the Book of Mormons. And uh, they begin to proceed. Would you take this? And I said, well, I am a Christian. They said, so are we. I said, praise God. And I said, well, a Christian does what Jesus does. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I said, that means then Jesus is doing it is written. Everything Jesus believed was based on it is written written. It is written. So I said, now I have no problem in accepting Joseph Smith if you can show me Joseph Smith in it is written. And I said, you know, when I left the world, I, I became a Christian. They didn't know what we were or what we did. But I said, when I left the world and Jesus came into my life and gave me, it gave me a personal experience, he made me fall in love with the Bible because it was his book. And then as I found and, 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 and de de uh, developed this experience with him, I said, then I, I began to love the word of God, and I wanted to do just like Jesus and everything he did. And I showed him in the Bible where it said that God always said, it is written, all the prophets. And then I said, can you show me Joseph Smith in the word of God? And so you know what they did? They took me over to a text. I won't take you there now, but they took me to Ezekiel and 37. And they went there, and they showed a, a, a picture of a stick. And I said... And they said, so now here's Joseph Smith, and they gave me their book. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, show me that that stick represents Joseph Smith from the Bible. And they said, what do you mean? I went to the Bible, and I showed them that the Bible says that the Bible should explain itself. That the Bible says that this is a dragon. We went to the Bible and showed that the Bible tells us what a dragon is. We don't have to make it up. The Bible says the dragon is Satan, Revelation 12, verse 9. So we looked at this, and I said, now, I don't reject Joseph Smith simply because he's Joseph Smith. I only reject what's not in the Word of God. So I said, please, if you can show me that Joseph Smith and he is in the Word of God, I'll be happy to embrace him. And so they went back to the Word of God, and, and, they said, and I said, well, does, any, does any text that shows what that is? They had no text. They went to another place in the Bible, and they said, well, see, Isaiah 29 says that the, 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 the book is sealed, and that book that's sealed is the Book of Mormons. I said, can you show me a text that says that, the, that this sealed book is the Book of Mormons? And they couldn't do it, of course. And all of a sudden, their heads begin to drop because they begin to recognize they did not have an understanding of the, of the Scriptures. And I said, now listen, I'm not against prophets. I said, let me show you from the Bible. And I went to the Bible and showed them, the Bible says in the last days God's going to have prophets. We showed them in the last days that God will pour out the spirit of prophecy, that his church would have the spirit of prophecy. And we showed them that from the word of God. I said, I believe in prophets because the Bible says so. And I said, you have to go to the Bible and show this. And we went through. And, of course, as we finished, we began to show them that Joseph Smith is not in the Bible, but the true church. In Revelation 12, we began to ask them, do you know who this true church is? Because the true church is the one who's going to have, because they call the Book of Mormons the testament of Jesus Christ. They call the Book of Mormons the spirit of prophecy. So we went to show them that if they were the spirit of prophecy, God never gives a prophet without first having a church. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, he sets his prophets in the church. So I said, in order to find the right prophet, you first got to find the right church. And in Revelation 12, it talks about the right church. And that church 
has not only the commandments of God, but that right church has the testimony of Jesus. So I said, now that is, if that's the Book of Mormons, you have to show me this is the right church. And we begin to start showing that's the prophet, then the law of God. And we went to show them, does your church keep the law of God? And we were able to walk through the Bible. And eventually, we were able to show. And they said, oh yes, our church keeps all of the Ten Commandments. It's never been changed. And we went to the law in Exodus and showed the, the Ten Commandments says, and we went through all of the commandments and then came back to the fourth and says, remember the Sabbath day. And I said, now, when I studied this, I found out that, 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 that Sunday is the first day of the week. And we went through seventh day is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. And we looked at this and I said, now, you said that your church, because it can't be the right church unless it has the commandments of, and then we can look for the prophets because the law and the prophets always go together to the law and the testimony. So the law and the testament go together. And we showed that Jesus always said this. And as we looked at this, the, the, those Mormons, the older one that was there and the little one, they said, don't we have some text? They picked up their books, but guess what? No text. They said, well, surely the, the, the God changed the day of worship and told us to go to church on Sunday. I said, you know what? I would be happy to believe that if you could just show me what? One text. I said, I'm a Christian. I believe in what Jesus says. It is written. It is written. Please, I don't reject it. Simply show me from the word of God. And they said, well, we don't want to be doubting Thomases. We got to believe. Dad, Thomas had to put his hands in, the, in his side. But we're to believe in the Book of Mormons and this without. And I said, yes, but there's a difference between faith and presumption. Where does faith come from? The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Romans 10, 17. So the Bible says that faith has its foundation in the promises and the word of God. So I said, it's not faith to put my hands to feel something. That's feeling. And faith and feeling are two different things. What God made Thomas believe was not simply touch me. Jesus, and we took them to Luke, he showed them in the Psalms and in all the prophets the things concerning himself. So he never said, believe me, just because I said this. And I said all this to say this. When they got back to that place, we showed them from the Word of God. They had to put their heads down. They did not understand the Word of God. This is not the Christian position. And then I said, you know what? I said, I understand. I said, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I believe that you're sincere to want to be a missionary as Mormons to come to this house. Many people are not doing this. People who even believe the truth are not going door to door. And I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. One of them said, well, we almost believe this. <laughs> they said, we're, we're not scholars. We don't understand the Bible like this. I said, it has nothing to do with being a scholar. It's about being a Christian, to be like Jesus. And then we went through and showed them that. And I said, but now, I said, the reason why I tell you is, I said, I know what it's like to try to get people to believe in a prophet. And I said, I believe in prophets. And we went through all that. We showed them. I said, our prophet from the Bible is Sister Ellen G. White. And I said, I can show you that from the, because everything the prophet says, the Bible says. And everything the Bible says, the prophet says. Now, if you believe that, you're almost a seven-day Adventist. And so we got the people to see that. And then we commended them and prayed and that God would lead them and to further truth. Praise God for this. But wouldn't it be a shame as seven-day Adventists to be put in that same position, but we don't understand the Bible? Do you think that every seven-day Adventist will be able to go through the scriptures and be able to show that? Even if we had the Sabbath, Everybody does not understand it. Even if we had the prophets, we don't understand that. We have to understand the Bible for our, we're in the book of Luke, chapter 10. What book did I say? We're in Luke, chapter 10. And I gave that as a foundation to show us why we need to be able to understand the Bible. Why we meet us must understand it for ourselves. Do you want to understand how to study the Bible? So in the book of Luke, chapter 10, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 26. <clears throat> Luke 10 Beginning in verse 26. They ask, let's start in verse 25. They asked Jesus a question in verse 25. Let's read that together, all together. What does it say? And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying what? Master, what shall I do to do what? Jesus said, well, just believe everything the church says and you'll have eternal life. Is that what he said? Just accept all the traditions of all the churches and you have eternal life. That's what he says? What did Jesus say? Luke 10, verse 26. What did Jesus direct the mind of his hearers to? Verse 26, let's read that together. It says, He said unto them, 
what is written where? In the law. And what's the last part? How readest thou? That's the name of our study this morning. How readest thou? Jesus directed them. Do you understand how to study the Bible? Jesus has said many times, you err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, we don't want to be in error not knowing the scriptures. We want to understand how to search the scriptures, how to study the scriptures, how readest thou. And we want not hard instructions. We want what? Simple instructions. All right. Now, what we have done, we've created an acronym to help us to simply understand how to study the Bible. What is an acronym? Anybody know what an acronym is? What is an acronym? Now, we're in a class. We're not preaching. This is not going to be a sermon whatsoever. We're going to take our time and we're going to be in a class. Now, when a teacher asks a question in a class, what does the teacher want? He wants a response. He wants an answer. So we're going to go back and forth because we can never learn how to study the Bible just simply in a sermon. We've got to study in, in a school to understand how it works. So I'm talking to you and I want you to talk back to, <laughs> back, back to me. So I ask again. And if we don't answer, we're going to be a long time looking at each other's faces. Is that right? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask the question again. Do you know what an acronym is? An acronym. Do you know what it is? All right. Well, you were close. An acronym. What is an acronym? Speak a little louder. So it's a word that each of the letters in that word stand for something else. For example, if I say that God has a plan in the ministry of healing. That God has a plan. Does God have a plan in the ministry of healing? Or did he just say, be healed and you're healed? Are there such a thing called natural law? Is there such a thing called natural law? How many laws are there? Eight. Eight simple laws. Well, God's plan is an acronym. G-O-D-S-P-L-A-N. And each of those letters in God's plan is an acronym that explains the eight laws of health. So G would stand for godly trust. The O stands for open air. The D stands for daily exercise. The X stands, S stands for sunlight that comes from sunshine. The P in God's plan stands for proper rest. The L in God's plan stands for lots of water. The A stands for always temperate. And the N stands for nutrition. Now, so in God's plan, that is an acronym. That, that is a word, but each of the letters represent something else. So that's an acronym. We're, we're familiar with that. It helps us to remember. Someone says, well, I don't remember the eight laws of health. Well, God's plan is a quick and simple way to remember it because God does have a plan in the ministry of healing. Someone says, what's his plan? Well, his plan is God's plan. Someone says, I thought he had a plan. He does. What is the plan? God's plan. What do you mean? Well, that's an acronym. So it's easy to remember that God has a plan to heal us. Do you know that simple plan, if you really understand it, can restore us from any disease? Well, we've lost track of that. We'll find out. That's not our study just now. Let's, let's move on. Here's an acronym. How readest thou? Here's the acronym for how readest thou. P, A, C, and B. Would you write that down? P, A, C, and B. And we're going to sum it up by saying pack B. That's like saying pack your Bible. Are you with me? Easy way to remember it, how to study the Bible, how to read it. Now, four simple principles, P-A-C-B, pack Bible. Remember it that way. In other words, if I want to study the Bible, I must learn to do what? Can I study my Bible if I don't pack my Bible and take it with me? No. So if I want to study my Bible, I need to pack it with me and pack my B or pack my Bible. So that pack Bible, those four letters, is an acronym to help us to remember how to simply study the Bible. Do we understand what I'm saying? So the P represents something, the A represents something, the C represents something, and the B represents something that teaches us how simply to study the Bible. Now, this is not an advanced course. This is simple instructions, but if you understand these simple instructions, you can understand how to study anything. Are you with me? All right, let's start off with P. Here's the P. Impact the Bible. Here's the P. What do you think that the P represents in how to study the Bible? What do you think the P represents? Let's go to Philippians. What would you say? Pray. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I heard my elder say, he said what? Prayer. 
Now, do you know that some people actually believe that they can study the Bible without prayer? So if I'm going to pack my Bible, the very first thing in the P, the very first thing I need to do, if I'm going to study the Bible, I must learn to do what? Pray. What if I try to study the Bible without prayer? Can I expect to understand? No. Go to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read this. Now, what I'm going to do is show you this. If the Bible is an inspired book, a divine book, then that means that the instructions of how to study the Bible should be inside of the Bible. Is that right? Let's say you buy an uh, electronic device. And you buy it, let's say a computer, and you don't know how to work the computer. What does the manufacturer put with the device so that you can understand it? What do they put with the device? Every device that is packaged today. What do they put with the device? A manual. And those manuals give you what? instructions of how to use what you have purchased. When Jesus purchased our life in Calvary, he didn't just purchase us and, and put this plan of redemption together. He actually has a manual to help us to go through the plan of redemption. And this manual, of course, is the Bible. Now, in this Bible, there is a manual inside of the manual. What do you mean? That the Bible is the manual, but the manual must contain instructions of how to use the manual. And you know that you'll find out that many devices have that. They'll put a manual and then say, well, this is how to use the manual. First, look at this part of the manual, then look at that part of the manual. So there is instructions in the Bible that helps us to explain how to study the Bible. And if it didn't do that, the Bible would be incomplete. If I had to go outside of the Bible to learn how to study the Bible, then I'm in trouble. But all that I need is in the, is in the Bible. Does that make sense? So I'm going to go to the Bible to learn how to study the Bible. Now, I'm going to tell you, when I didn't understand this, God took me through the Bible and explained this to me by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sharing with you what God shared with me many years ago. When I became converted, left the world, I prayed to God. After God began to change my life, I didn't understand it, but I knew that God came to my life. And I said, Lord, please, teach me how to study the Bible. If you teach me, I'll teach anyone. And God began to show me what I'm getting ready to share with you right now. And everything that I've learned was based on this four basic principles of how to study do you want to know? The first thing is this, P. Now, Philippians 4, and I showed you that because we now must go to the Bible and let the Bible tell us this is what we should be doing in studying the Bible. Now, what I did, I didn't know this. When I did all I started doing, when God came into my life and I began to start wanting something different, I picked up the Bible and I said, Lord, teach me. And I didn't know where to start. And I was impressed. I didn't know what it was. It was the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it, but I went to the book of Revelation first. I said, why, well, all uh, those puts in the Bible, people will talk about that, but I know I don't, even, I don't understand anything about the book of Revelation. And so I went to Revelation and I started in the last, uh, almost the last chapter. I actually started in Revelation uh, chapter 20. And I said, well, 22, I know that's heaven. I know something about, I've heard something about that, but, but let me start in 20, uh, 21, uh, 20. And I started in Revelation 20 and I read it and there was a fire burning in my stomach. I didn't, I didn't understand anything I read. <laughs> but I recognized the presence of God was there. And I read that, that was the first time I read through the whole chapter by myself. And I was, I said, Lord, I, I'm enjoying this. I hated the Bible before, but, but Lord, I'm enjoying this. Even though I don't understand it, I'm enjoying it. And I read it and I said, well, while I'm enjoying this, I better read another chapter. So I read chapter 19. I thought this might be once in a lifetime. So I read chapter 19. I didn't understand what I was reading. I didn't understand the symbols, all a bunch of symbols, but the fire burning in my breast. I knew the presence of God was there. I read chapter 19, then chapter 18 then chapter 17, then chapter 16, then chapter 15, then chapter 14. And I read all the way back to chapter 1. And the reason why I did it that way, because I didn't believe that I was going to read anymore. But the fire was there. And do you know, it was late at night. My friends had went out and partying in the world, but I stayed where I was. And I said, leave me. I, I want to be alone. And I didn't explain what I was doing, but God had begun to make a change in my life. And I said, Lord, if you teach me, I'll teach somebody else. And then I got back to chapter 1, I said, I can't believe this. I read through the whole book of Revelation. I've never done this in my life. I didn't understand it, but I was enjoying it. I understood some things, but I enjoyed it. And then, as I began to look at this, I looked back at the clock. And do you know that I actually read through the entire night the book of Revelation? And it felt to me like five minutes. And I had read straight through the night. The sun was rising in the morning. And I said, Lord, I've never read through the Bible like this. I've never enjoyed the Bible like this. I've hated it. But God, I knew 
that the, what just took place in my heart was as real as the conversion of Saul to Paul on the Damascus Road. Where before I loved sports, and where before I loved the world, and where before I loved television, and where before I loved partying, and where before I was bored with the Bible, now something had happened to my heart. And I found a greater joy in the Bible than anything else. And I tell you now, the Bible is sweet to me now. It gets so sweet, uh, nothing else can compare to the sweetness of studying the Word of God. But you've got to understand how to open it up, how to read a style, and we found an acronym that we put together. What is an acronym? An acronym is a what? An acronym is a word that, it, that each of its letters represent something else. What is the acronym that we use of how to study the Bible? PACB. B. P A C B. What's the first letter? P. All right. So let's see what this P is. Philippians 4, verse 6. Let's read that together. Philippians 4, verse 6. Let's read that. What does it say in Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6? I pray you're writing this down. This is very important. Philippians 4, verse 6. What does it say? Let's read it together. What does it say? Be careful for, what's the next word? Now, when you read the Bible, read it slowly. Read it how? Read it slowly. I talk fast, but I read slow. Read the Bible slowly. It says, be careful for nothing. Read every word. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but, but what? So when we study the Bible, we can't just skip over words. We need to look carefully at how many words? Every word. So the Bible says, be careful for, what's the next word? Nothing. So how many things should I do without being careful? How many things? No things, nothing. Then the next thing says, be careful for nothing, but in how many things? Everything. everything. How much does that include everything? How much does that include? Well, that's everything. <laughs> so it says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So if I'm going to do anything or everything before I do it, I should do what? Pray. So before I drive in the car, what should I do? And if I don't pray before I drive, am I following the Bible? I would be afraid to drive with someone who didn't pray. And if they didn't, I would pray. <laughs> I remember we were in an island to do a meeting, and they had, no, they had a very small uh, uh, runway to get in and to get out. And this particular place that we went in was a little place called Montserrat. Volcanoes destroyed most of the island. And while we was there, and we were in the place doing, getting ready to do a meeting, the airplane that they was getting ready to leave, two airplanes had just blown up trying to leave that place just a little bit before we were there. And so the plane, the, they didn't have these big planes that the airport wouldn't let them do it. The, the, air, the plane, airplane was so small, there was about eight people in the plane. My family almost made 50% of the plane. <laughs> and so we were in the plane, and I could actually put my hand forward and touch the pilot. So as we got ready to leave, I, I didn't know about what had taken place. This, the very airways had been blowing up. As we got ready to leave, and he got ready to just get in. I said, uh, pilot, sir, let me pray before we play, before we fly. And I touched him. I said, do you mind if we pray? Now, of course, he knew about the explosion. He didn't mind. Praise God. And I said, now, if he did, I would have said, well, praise God, you mind, I don't. Let's pray. And I would have just prayed anyway. And so I grabbed hold of him, but he did. And there were other passengers in the plane, some were not seven Adventists, whatever. But they didn't, nobody mind praying when they thought that they might die. Hey, are you with me? Even an atheist doesn't mind prayer if he believes he's getting ready to die. And so I prayed. And God, of course, took us safely. No matter what we do, we should pray. Now, studying the Bible. Some people are getting ready to study the Bible and they don't think prayer is important. Someone says, what is one of the most important things? Do you know that prayer is one of the most important parts of study? Somebody asked Martin Luther about prayer. He said that prayer is the better part of study. So if I'm going to study the Bible, the first thing I must do is what? Pray. Does the Bible say that? Does the Bible say that? Where's my class? Does the Bible say that? Yes, praise God. All right, now let's go to the screen. Let's watch what the prophet says concerning this. This is Great Controversy, page 599. Now, I'm going to give you two chapters. I believe that the best way to learn how to study the Bible is to study the Bible. But I believe that there are two chapters in the book Great Controversy that teaches us how to study the Bible more importantly than any other chapters that I've ever read. And the two chapters in Great Controversy, one is called Snares of Satan, and the other is called Scripture, Our Safeguard. Those two chapters in the book of Great Controversy actually teach us how to study the Bible. In the book Great Controversy, what are the two chapters called? Please write this down. Snares, Snares of Satan scripture. and Scripture, our safeguard. Snares of Satan begins, I believe, about page 519. 
518, 519, but it's snares of Satan. And in Great Controversy, uh, Scripture I see starts about 593, 594. But these two chapters, you're studying them now. Do you know when I learned this, I had never read through this book before. When I studied this, the Holy Spirit shared what I'm studying with you. The Holy Spirit shared it with me by himself from the Bible. But then later on as I became converted and I began to get the book Great Controversy and I began to read through the book Great Controversy, I found exactly what I found from the Bible and the Holy Spirit. I saw it in these two chapters in Great Controversy and I said, dear God, this is there. The same thing that you showed me were actually there. I believe that this was a prophet because the very same spirit that inspired me from the word of God, I saw in the Great Controversy in the spirit of prophecy. And so I knew that the same spirit that was inspiring me before I ever read the words of the prophet was the same person that was inspiring Sister Ellen G. White, and I knew that it was the same thing. Are you with me? So we're going to see now what I saw. Great Controversy, page 599. Now, let's preach. Now, when I get you to participate, the reason why it's important is you learn more, you retain more, and you experience more when you interact it. The more you read, when you touch the Bible, the more your senses come into what happened in hearing and touching and smelling and tasting. The more you get involved, the more it becomes a part of you. So when I say read, it's all right to read in your mind, but do you know that when you read out loud, you actually begin to learn it better? Your voice gets into it. Your, your hands get into it. When you touch the Bible, it's better than just having it on a cell phone when you can actually turn to the pages and feel it. That more of the senses that are brought in, the eyes, the ear, the touch, it becomes a part of us. Now let's read this. Great Controversy, page 599. What does it say all together? What does it say? It says what? The Bible should, what's the next word? Never be studied without what? Did we just see that from the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. It says... The Holy Spirit alone can cause us to feel the importance of those things easy to be understood. Now, what we're studying now is easy to be understood. Some people get bored with things that are simple, but the Holy Spirit can actually make us be impressed with those things that are easy to be understood. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But then number two, it says, it says it can make us feel the importance of those things easy to be understood or prevent us. Now, we should be reading this together. We should be reading this together, right? Let's read it together. Or prevent us from what? Wrestling truths difficult of what? So some things are simple, but we get bored with it. The Holy Spirit helps us to be impressed with it. Some things are complicated, so we don't understand it, but God takes both of them and makes us understand it. The question is, how readest thou? Now let's continue. It says, it is the office of heavenly angels to prepare the heart so to comprehend God's now, we, we don't want to forget. Now, I, see, we're in school, so we're taking our time. You're not reading with me. I see a few people reading, but everyone that can see should be reading with me. Can you see back in the back? Can you see in the front here? Can you, can you see it fine? Can we read together, please? It says, it is the office of heavenly angels to prepare the heart to so comprehend God's word that we shall be charmed with its... Do you know the Holy Spirit can actually make the Bible look beautiful to us? where it gets interesting to us, more interesting than a television, more interesting than the internet, more interesting than games or work or whatever. But it's the Holy Spirit. So if we're bored with the Bible, you know we're absent of, we're absent of the Holy Spirit. When we can come to the Bible and we, oh man, why do I have to, do you know that actually shows us that we have no Holy Spirit? But this says, can God give us the Holy Spirit, yes or no? Praise God. If we were bored with it, he can make us find joy in the scriptures. It says, uh, uh, God's word that we should be charmed with this beauty, admonished by its warnings. Or what? Animated. That means life has been given to us. Animated and strengthened by his promises. When I read the word of God, it animates me. I said, man, this is powerful. It says, animated by his promises. Let's read this together. Let's continue. We should what? Make the psalmist's petitions our own. What does psalm, the psalmist pray? He pray what? Open thou mine eyes that I may behold what? wondrous things out of the law. Now, is that in the Bible? Yes. Now, this is another point. When you study the spirit of prophecy, when the spirit of prophecy mentions a Bible text, write the Bible text down. Follow the Bible text. Don't just read the spirit of prophecy. Someone says, well, I, I, we're studying the spirit of prophecy, but we don't study the Bible. But do you know that you, if you go to the Great Controversy, I, I, I challenge you. If you go through every chapter of the Great Controversy, I challenge you to look at how many scriptures are used in every chapter. Do you know that you find no less, you find in many chapters 20 scriptures in the chapter. 
30 scriptures in the chapter, and someone says, oh, you just believe in spirit prophecy, but not the Bible, you will find that the spirit prophecy actually leads us back to the what? And actually helps us to better understand the word of God. We might have jumped over this text, but this text tells us what to pray when we get ready to study the word of God. Where is that in the, in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? Let's go there. Let's go to Psalms. Let's go there. Psalms what? 119. Now, sometimes the spirit prophecy quotes the Bible, but it doesn't give the verse. So if you're studying the spirit of prophecy and it quotes the Bible text, but it doesn't give the verse, if you're a good student, what do you do? You go find the text. Now, what would you use to find the text? Because you don't know every text in your mind. You use a concordance. What is a concordance? What is a concordance? What is a concordance? Praise God. A concordance is a book that puts every major word in the Bible in alphabetical order. So that someone says, I don't know what the word is. Now, these are simple things, but a concordance is a tool that you want with you if you study the Bible. And that concordance will allow you to go alphabetically. So if you want to see sleep and you want to understand about sleep, then you can go to the concordance, A, B, C, you go to S, you go to sleep, you can look up all the texts in the Bible when the word sleep is used. Are you with me? And so this is what a concordance is. So if you see something in spirit prophecy and you don't know where it is, you pick your concordance up, you look it up, and you can find the text. Are you with me? A student would want to do this. Now, Psalms 119 is here. Praise God, this particular text, the actual verse is here. What verse in Psalms 119? Let's read verse 18 together. Psalms 119, verse 18. What does it say? It says what? Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. This is a text that's saying the same things. So we're getting ready to study. Do you know that we can claim this text as a promise? And say, Lord, as I study, I want you to do what? So before I pray, before I study, never. Do you know what the Spirit of actually says? That when we open the Bible to study without prayer, that demons will come and cause us to misunderstand what we're reading. That's why someone says, I have a question for you. And they, they take me to the Bible. I said, please, let's pray. I never open the Bible to look at it without what? Prayer. Because if you don't, the moment that you don't pray, the devil comes and will suggest to you a meaning that is not really in the text. Always pray before you open up the Word of God. It's not a routine. When I pray, I pray this. Even this morning, as I was studying the Word of God personally in my devotion, before we had family devotion. I was praying to God and I was talking to him and I said, dear Lord, I don't want to just study the Bible as a routine, just reading and reading. I want a real experience with Jesus. Please open my heart, open my eyes. I told him. And as I began to do this, God began to show me some, he showed me some beautiful things this morning. I can't stay. That's not what we're studying now, but he showed me some wonderful things. But this is an experience that we can have with Jesus every morning that God wants to commune with us and talk to us as a friend. When I pick up the Bible, I can hear Jesus talk to me. Jesus wants to be to us a familiar friend. Now, this says, we should make the psalmist petition our own. Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Temptations often appear irresistible through neglect of what? Prayer and the study of the Bible. The tempted one cannot readily remember God's promises and meet Satan with the scripture weapons. Now, we were studying that in family devotion this morning about these weapons, but that's another study. So now, my brothers and sisters, this becomes important that we need to understand that most times we can't stop sinning because it appears this, the temptation appears irresistible because we don't study the Bible enough so that the promises of the Scripture are in our what? Thy word have I hid in my that I might not sin against God. Now that's another point, but I want to stop here. Number one, P. What does the P stand for? The P stands for what? Prayer. So if I want to study the Bible, what's the first thing I want to do if I want to learn how to study the Bible? I must do what? And what is the one prayer that God said we can pray it specifically and make it our own personal prayer? What is the prayer? What does it say? What is that personal prayer? Praise God. That what? That I might behold wondrous things out of the law. You know, remember the Bible says, how readest thou? What is in the law? What is written in the law? And how readest thou? What is the prayer that we can make our own? Speak a little louder, please. Praise God. What is that prayer? Sister, yes. Open my eyes that I may do what? That I may behold one understand. Sister, young sister, what is that prayer? So that means for us, do you know in the mornings we can claim that promise upon our knees and say, Lord, I want to see 
Great and mighty things, I know it's not, and God will do this. So the very first thing is to pray. Now, here's another quotation saying something very similar. Great Controversy, page 530. This is going back now, snares of Satan. Watch what this says. It says, Satan is well aware that the weakest soul who abides in Christ is more than the match for the host of darkness, and that should he reveal himself openly, he will be met in what else? This says, I'm going, I'm jumping now. No man is safe for a day or an hour without what? We should pray without 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It says, especially should we entreat the Lord for wisdom to understand his what? What does especially mean? What does that mean? Does that mean general or, or is that something special? So do you know some people say, well, I pray all the time. But do you know that's not what it's talking about? When I study the Bible, do you know I should make a special prayer? Lord, I want to understand the Bible as I've never understood it before. I should make a special prayer. Lord, as I open the Bible this time, may it be your voice speaking to me. Help me to understand those things that are simple. Make them interesting. You know, we should pray that, Lord, make me more interested with the Bible than with the world, than with the television, than with the Internet, than with games, than with play. And do you know that the Holy, that's the office of the Holy Spirit to make us love the Bible and see its beauty. Do you want to see the beauty of the Word of God? Then you can say with the psalmist, the word of God is sweeter than honey. Is it sweet to you? It's sweet to me. Is it sweet to you? It's sweet. Now, it says, here are revealed the wiles of the tempter and the means by which we may be successfully, he may be successfully resisted. Satan is an expert in doing what? Quoting scripture. Placing his own what? Interpretation upon passages by which he hopes to cause us to stumble. So if I don't pray, the devil will come and suggest an interpretation of the Bible that is not true. We're going to find that the much heresy has entered the church through the scriptures, but a false interpretation because we do not know how to study the Bible. But the first thing we must do is pee. Pack your Bible. Pee. That means to pray. That means prayer. Always pray. Not sometimes, but what? Never. Oh, so what if right now I say, okay, well, we haven't studied the Bible yet, and someone comes to you and says, I want you to explain to me the Bible. And then all of a sudden, they open the Bible and say, please read this to me. What do you say to them? Let's pray. What if you wake up in the morning, and you say, well, now, Lord, I've been in your presence. I, I, I know that you've been so good to me. I, I want to study the Bible. And then you go to the Bible. What's the first thing you do? Pray. And that's simple. Amen? And can we claim a promise? What promise? Psalms 119, 18 says, open thou my what? Now, what about A? Pack your Bible. P-A. Here's the A. What do you think that the A represents and how to study the Bible? What do you think the A represents? The first thing, the A represents the attitude. The what? Attitude. What is an attitude? To go to Psalms in your Bible, Psalms 25. We're turning to Psalms 25, but what do you think an attitude is? Talk to me. If I tell you an attitude, you, that person has a bad attitude. That person has a good attitude. What is an attitude? Your emotions, how you feel, how do you perceive things. These are, these are all things talking about how we approach the Bible. Now, do you know that most people actually approach the Bible in a way that makes God not be able to teach them? Now, do we have any teachers in this room? Is there, is there a teacher in this room? Any, anybody ever been a teacher before? Uh, well, everybody has probably been a, has been a teacher at some point, but I, you know what I mean, as a professor. Anybody, okay, no, no teachers here. Okay, well, if you were to talk, you will find out that a teacher will tell you that the hardest teacher, to, the hardest student to teach is not the ignorant student, but is the student that thinks he knows when he doesn't. So a, a person can know nothing and he can be easy to be taught. But when the person actually thinks he knows, he's hard to teach. Do you know that it's easier for me to teach a worldling, an atheist, a person who doesn't know anything about the Bible, I have found it easier to teach them what the plan of redemption is than to teach a seven heavens. It's easier to teach a Baptist or a Mormon or a Catholic about the three angels' messages than it is to teach a seven day Adventist. Did you know that? I, I, when we go around the world, it's easier to teach a Roman Catholic, a priest, than to teach a seven day Adventist. Why? Because seven heavens, we, we feel like we're rich and increased with goods. Oh, I know the three hundred. I know the gospel. I know, but well, we don't know nothing. Amen. The Bible says that. Do you know what I said? When I say something to you, I'm not just saying it. There's a text behind everything I'm telling you. In fact, before we go to Psalms, let's go to 1 Corinthians. We'll come back to Psalms. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 8. 
As I'm talking to you, God is talking to me. I'm, I, I'm sharing with you what God is sharing with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, notice what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 2. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2. This is the text that A.T. Jones used in 1888 before he started his message on righteousness by faith to the denomination. 1 Corinthians 8 beginning in verse 2. What does it say in verse 2? All together, what does it say? And if any man, how many people does that take in? How many people? Everybody. And if any man think that he knoweth how many things? So what if you and I think we know anything, what does the Bible say about us? He knoweth what? Nothing yet as he ought to know. That's a beautiful text, isn't it? So what if I think I understand three angels' messages? What does the Bible say? I know nothing. How much do I know? So when we approach that way, we approach on equal ground. Whether a pastor or a person, whether a leader or a laity, whether clergy or a common person, we're all on the same level when we approach the Bible. This is why we're not papal, we're Protestant. In the papal church, they reserve the right of interpretation to the clergy. You'll find that in that chapter, Great Controversy, the Scripture I Save God that the papacy teaches that no one can understand the Bible, not the common person, but only the priest. And he must interpret the Bible and you must accept the interpretation of the priest, whatever you think. That is not Protestant. The Protestant position is the Christian position that means that we should study the Bible for our... All right, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2 says that. Now let's go back to Psalms 25. If we think that we know nothing yet as we ought to know, the Bible tells us that that is a certain type of attitude. Go to Psalms 25. What attitude is that? Psalms 25. Now I'm going to ask you before we read it. You're going to Psalms 25, but I'm going to ask you before you read it. What type of attitude do you think we should have before we study the Word of God? What would you say? Humble. Is that what you said? Humble. Praise God. Someone else? Gratitude? Yes. But this, this attitude, do you know that if we don't have a humble attitude, that we cannot understand anything from the Word of God? Do you know that the attitude we have is more important even than the method of how we study the Bible? Now, most people, when you try to start talking about how to study the Bible, the first thing they tell you is the mechanics of studying the Bible. If you were to go to many camps today where they're talking about how to study the Bible, one of the first things they will tell you is the mechanics of how to do it, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is first prayer, second, our attitude. Do you know that we can use the right mechanics with the wrong attitude and still get nothing? Look at Psalms 25. Look what the Bible calls the attitude. Psalms 25, we're going to begin in Psalms 25, beginning in verse 8. Verse 8. What does verse 8 say? Psalms 25, beginning in verse 8. What does verse 8 say? Can you read for me loud and clear? What does it say? Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he what? He will teach sinners in the way. So here it's talking about God getting ready to teach us. God's getting ready to do what? So if he's teaching, we should be what? Learning as students. Well, now notice the attitude that we must have. Verse 9. What does verse 9 say? The meek will he guide in judgment. Now, what happened to my class? I don't hear you reading with me. I, don't hear, I, hear, I hear this little group here. But I want everybody to be joining me. Verse 9, all together. The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. Who is God going to teach? Who is God going to teach? The meek. So what if I'm not meek? Can he teach me? What does it mean to be meek? What word is associated with meek? Lowly, humble. Jesus said, learn of me. Come unto me, all you that labor in heaven, laden, and I will give you rest. He said, learn of me, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in you know, we can pretend to be meek outwardly. We, I'm meek. But that's not what it says. Meek and lowly where? You know that outwardly we can appear, I'm, I'm humble, but inside of our heart we can be prideful. I know everything. I'm such a great student in the Bible. I, I know everything. Do you know that God can teach us if we have that attitude? But do you know that God will teach us everything if we were humble like little children? Not so we can preach and show how great we are, but so that we can have an attitude to learn. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, let's see what the prophet says concerning this attitude. Great Controversy 521. Now, can you imagine my surprise when I saw everything from the Bible in the spirit of prophecy the first time I read Great Controversy? The same thing. Pack, P-A, the A stands for what? The A stands for what? Attitude. What does the P stand for? Prayer. 
The A stands for attitude. Now let's read this together and see if you find this word as we study. Look for the word. Let's read Great Controversy 521 all together. What does it say? It says, whenever the what? Study of scriptures is entered upon without a what? Prayer for, what's the next word? Humble. What in our text associates with humble? Meek. What in our text is it closely associated with humble? Meek. It says, Enter without a prayerful, humble, what's the next word? Teachable. Because the meek will he teach. So the teachable spirit is a what spirit? A meek spirit. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. It says that, that, that whenever it's entered upon without a prayerful, humble, teachable spirit, what happens? Let's read that together. The what? The plainest and simplest as well as the most difficult passages will be wrested from their true meaning. Did you get that? What if I don't have a meek attitude or humble attitude when I approach the word of God? What about the simple things of the Bible? Will I understand it? What about the difficult things in the Bible? Will I understand it? This says that if I don't have that meek attitude, that humble attitude, the plainest, that's the clearest things, the simplest as well as the most difficult passages will be wrested from their true meaning. So before I know the mechanics, I must pray and have the right attitude, which is a meek, humble, lowly attitude, not that I know, but that I don't know, that God knows. Are you with me? It says the papal leaders, talk about the leaders of the papal church. The papal leaders select such portions of scriptures as best serve their purpose, interpret to suit themselves, and then present these to the people. While they deny them, them the privilege of studying the Bible and understanding the sacred truths for themselves, the whole Bible shall be given to the people just as it reads. I don't have to make it up. I let the Bible explain itself. Now it says, let, let's read together. It says what? It what what? be better for them not to have Bible instruction at all than to have the teaching of the scriptures thus grossly misrepresented. Now watch. 530. Great Controversy 530. 530. What does this one say? It says we should what? Study the Bible with humility, not simply outwardly, but humility of what? Would it be meek and lowly in heart? It says, that's Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. It says, never losing sight of our dependence upon what? Are we going to understand the Bible because we're intelligent? Is that what's going to make us understand the Bible? Someone says, well, I'm ignorant. I can't understand the Bible. I'm not so intelligent. That is not how to study the Bible. It has more to do with our attitude. Now, this says, while we must constantly guard against the devices of Satan, we should pray in faith continually, lead us not into what? temptation. Let's continue. Here's our attitude and purpose. Now, make you sure you put that as part of the, uh, 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 part of A. So, pack, prayer. A, attitude and purpose. What is our purpose for studying the Word of God? You know, you can have the right attitude and still have the wrong what? Purpose. And so, we need the right attitude and the right what? If you don't have the right purpose, I don't care what mechanics you use, God is not going to give it to us because there's a reason of why he teaches us. There is a purpose. And see, this is important because right now, many in the center of his church are studying with the wrong purpose. You know what the purpose of studying the Bible is? There are two great purposes. How many purposes? Two great purposes. We're still looking at A. A stands for attitude and purpose. Let's see if we can find this inspiration. We're in Great Controversy, still 599. All we're doing is reading those two chapters and we're seeing everything the prophet says is in the Bible, yes or no? Yes. And everything the Bible says the prophet is saying, they're saying the same thing. Now let's look at this. Great Controversy, 599, paragraph 1. Let's read it together. Now please, this starts getting sweet and good. Now we take our time and chew. Now when, I, when we try food, you know that the food begins to break down and more flavor comes out when we slowly chew the food. This is what we're doing as we're reading Let's read this. What does it say? All together, all together. It says what? We should exert all the powers of the mind in the study of the scriptures and should task the understanding to what? Does it mean that we have to use all the brain power? Yes or no? But it's not just dependent upon the brain power. Now, we must use all this brain power. Daniel's mind troubled him, his cognitations. But it says, as far as mortals can, the deep things of God, yet we must not forget the docility and submission of a child. When it says docility, what is it talking about docility? Docile. That means that we're not trying to be aggressive. We're not saying, I know that we're weakly, meekly and weakly saying, I don't know, but you do know. 
To submit is talking about this docility. It says the docility and submission of a child is the true spirit of the what? So now with the concordance, what is another tool that will be helpful as we study? A dictionary. A what? Why a dictionary? They help us to understand the words that are being used. Are you with me? So with the concordance, a dictionary. Concordance, find the text. Dictionary help us to better understand the words that are used in the English language or the language that we are studying it in. Whether it's Spanish, whatever, there are always dictionaries in every language. The dictionary helps us to understand the word usages. Now, it says, scriptural difficulties can, what's that next word? What does never mean? Now, what this is getting ready to say is very interesting. Because when you go to, and you come to a place where there's universes around or uh, science around, sometimes we think that we can approach the scriptures. Now, follow me before you read. Follow me. Sometimes we think that we can actually approach the scriptures the same way we study science and education. But this is not the same thing. This is not a natural book. This is a supernatural book. Watch what it says. Now, let's read it together. Scriptural difficulties can, not sometimes, but never be mastered. We cannot master divinity. It can never be mastered by the same, what's the next word? Methods that are employed in grappling with philosophical problems. So many people try to take their understanding of philosophical problems to study the word of God, and we use the same science and the same exegesis. We use the same, but that is not Bible and spirit prophecy. Do you know that right now today, I, I, you may not know it, but if you were to go, I'm going to pause this for a moment. If you were to go to, to a theology school, where they teach you how to study the Bible, do you know that the books that are being used, and I know because I've seen it, do you know that the books that are being used that many of the scholars don't even believe that God is in touch with the world? The books are written. I saw a book that most theology majors are using and pastors to study the Bible, and the book itself, if you study the author, the author is a deist. He doesn't even believe that God has daily interaction with mankind. As, can they teach you how to study the Bible? But the Bible teaches you how to study the Bible. Amen. All right, let's come back. Now this says, scriptural difficulties can never be mastered by the same methods that are employed in grappling with philosophical problems. Let's pick up together again. It says, we should what? Not engage in the study of the Bible. We should, we should not engage in the study of the Bible with that self-reliance with which so many enter the domains of what? Science. But with a prayerful dependence upon what? God. And a sincere desire, not to learn what we want, but a sincere desire to learn what? What if the Bible says something different than what we want to hear? You know, this is one of the reasons why most people don't understand the Bible. They want the Bible to explain to them what they want to do. And if the Bible says something different, they say, well, I don't understand the Bible. It's not that you understand. You don't want to do what you just understood. <laughs> Jesus said, him that will do the will of God, he shall understand the doctrine. John 7, 17. So if we will do what God says, it will make you better understand. If you had a spirit, an attitude, Lord, whatever you say I want to do it, even if it's not what I want, whether it's diet or dress or music or education, whatever it is, even if it's not what I want, if I will be willing to do it, you know you'll understand much more from the word of God. It says we must come with a humble and teachable spirit to obtain a knowledge from the great I am. Otherwise, what's going to happen if we don't do this? Evil angels will so blind our minds and harden our hearts that we shall not be impressed by the truth. Sometimes I'm not impressed, but it has nothing to do with the Bible. Sometimes it's because we don't come with the right attitude. A stands for what? Attitude and purpose. Now watch this now. Watch this now. Great Controversy 599. Next paragraph, paragraph 2. What does it say? Together. It says, many a portion of Scripture which learned men pronounce a what? Mystery or pass over as what? So the, the theologians say you can't understand that. But it says, is full of comfort and instruction to him who has been taught, not in the schools of this world, but in the school of what? Christ. Praise God. We can be in that school right now. Jesus said, how readest thou? This is the school. It says, one reason. Let's read that together. One reason why many, what? Theologians have no clear understanding of God's word is because they don't know Hebrew. Is that what it says? They don't know Greek. Is that what it says? But that's what you're being taught. You're being told as a common person that the only way to study the scriptures, you've got to know Hebrew, you've got to know Greek, you've got to know these principles that we're taught in theological schools or you cannot interpret the word of God. Where in the Bible does it say that? Where in the spirit of prophecy does it say that? 
Zero. It says, one reason why many theologians have no clear understanding of God's word is they close their eyes to truths which they do not what? Wish to practice. So if we want to do it, you can understand more if you will do something. The Bible says a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. If we're willing to practice it. What's the next thing? It says, an understanding of Bible truth depends not so much on the power of intellect brought to the search as on the singleness of what? So that tells us then our attitude and our what? Purpose. The earnest longing after righteousness. So what is the attitude that we should have as God's going to teach us? The attitude is a meek, humble, teachable spirit that reason must bow before the great I am. What if you thought that man could not stop sinning? But the Bible says that man can stop sinning. And if you go through the text, what do you accept? Not my will, but what? What if you thought that it was all right to eat something, but God's word says it's not all right to eat something, what do you say? Thy will be done. Speak, Lord, for thy servant here. If you take that humble, docile spirit, whether it's in diet or dress or music or recreation or association, if everything in life, do you know that you will understand just like Jesus understood? The reason why Jesus understood so much, there was never a man more meek than Jesus. And so the Father was able to teach him more than any other person on this earth because of the attitude that Jesus had. There was never a man that understood more because Jesus was in direct harmony with the purpose of his Father than you and I must understand what that purpose is. Are you with me? Two great purposes. How many great purposes? Many, many things, but two great purposes. What do you think is the first great purpose of studying the Bible? Someone says to learn the will of God. A long, she's looking right at the quotation. Praise God, sister. This earnest long after righteousness. We're going to make it clear. We're going to let Jesus tell us. Is that all right? Is that all right? We'll let Jesus tell us. Go to John. Go to John chapter 5. And let's see what Jesus says in John chapter 5. Now, in our home, and we, we homeschool, and we have a Bible class that we put together. In our Bible class, we talk about the very purpose of what the Bible is all about. Now, in John chapter 5, this is one of the things that we were studying. What is the purpose of the Bible? We see more than learning a bunch of facts we need to learn facts, but we need to understand what the purpose of the facts are for. In John chapter 5, beginning in verse 39. John 5, verse 39. What does the Bible say? Search the Scriptures. What is another way of saying search the Scriptures? Study. So the Bible says, search the Scriptures, for in them, that is in the Scriptures, ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which what? So many people think that in searching the scriptures, they're going to find eternal life simply like going through the scriptures, but that's not the purpose of the scriptures. The Pharisees sometimes went to the scriptures. Sometimes the theologians can go to the scriptures, but you know that you can search the scriptures for the wrong purpose. So what is the purpose of searching the scriptures? The Bible says, these are they that you think you have turned life in the scriptures, and they, the scriptures, are they which do what? So what does the scriptures do? The scriptures do what? They testify. What's another word of testifying? The scriptures do what? They reveal Jesus. Verse 40. And ye will not, what's the next three words? Come to me that you might have what? So how does the scriptures contain life? The scriptures contain life because they reveal who? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So as the scriptures reveal Jesus, they reveal life. And the purpose of the scriptures is to bring us to Jesus. The purpose of the scriptures is to bring us to Christ. He says, and yet they revealed, they testified me. Verse 40 says, and you will not come to me. What good would it be to learn everything the Bible says but not come to Jesus? The Bible is a schoolmaster. The Bible is a what? It is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. How read us, what does the law say? How read us now? Every law, everything in the Bible, all the writings are schoolmasters that are designed to bring us to Jesus. The person. So my brothers and sisters, the reason why God has given us the Bible, the very first reason that he's given us the Bible, the very first purpose, I study it meekly, what for? That I may come to who? Jesus. Is that why you study the Bible? Do you study so you can teach it? Is that why you study the Bible? Do you study so you can preach it? Is that why you study the Bible? Do you study so you can show how much you know about the scriptures? This is not the purpose or attitude of studying the Bible. The purpose, number one, is to find a friendship with Jesus Christ. So in the morning when I'm studying the Bible, I'm not studying in the morning simply because I'm going to preach I'm studying because I want to find friendship and fellowship with Jesus. Now, when you study that way, God will open up the Bible to you. Now, 
do you know that you can learn facts without understanding friendship? I read of a man, it was a true story of a man, he was put in prison. And the man who was put in prison, he spent all of his time, because in prison you have a lot of time, you understand that, don't you? Uh, but in prison he had a lot of time, and what he did for fun was memorize the Bible. Do what? Memorize the Bible. Do you know that he memorized the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation? But he was no more spiritual than he was from the very beginning. He did it as, a, as, just, as just a show off. And so people come to him and they said, do you know this text? He would quote the text. you know this text? He would quote the text. He memorized it in his mind, but it did not affect his what? Heart. He was not studying it so he could find Jesus and practice what was being said. Many of the things that he knew in his mind, he was violating and drinking and doing other things. He knew it in the mind, but he did not know it in the heart. Do we study the Bible just to find facts? No. Now, do we ignore the facts? No. Now, my wife is here. I could say some things, and I could ask you, and you could spend some time. You can come to me and say, tell me some facts about your wife. I could tell you where she was born. I can tell you about her family. I can tell you many, many different facts about her life, what she likes, what she doesn't like, what she eats, what she doesn't eat, what she wears, what she doesn't wear. I can go through all those facts. You can learn a hundred things about that. Do you know her? You have facts that you've gotten about her, but you don't know her. Are you with me? Now, if you ask me about my wife and I told you the same facts, I told you where she was born, how, what she did, what she put on, what she liked, disliked, would I tell you different facts? I would tell you the same facts because I told you already. But though those two facts are the same, I got those facts were gotten in two different ways. You got those facts just as facts. I got those facts through a what? Relationship. The Bible is that way. You're going to learn facts when you study the Bible, no question. But you're not studying the Bible just to learn facts. You're studying the Bible to find an experience of friendship with Jesus. And in the process, you learn the facts of the Bible through fellowship, through friendship. But that is not your purpose. Does it make sense? Inspiration says, and it says, and understanding the Bible truth depends not so much on the power of intellect brought to search as on the singleness of purpose, the earnest longing after righteousness. The first purpose for studying the Bible is what? Somebody over here tell me. What is the first purpose of studying the Bible? Say again. I long for righteousness, but we, 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 you're right, but I can't let you get away with that in the class right now because we just study what we just talked about. What's the first purpose? It is to bring us to what? Jesus. What, what does it do when we, we're brought to Jesus? It's to find a what? Friendship with Jesus. That's the purpose of studying the Bible. What's the purpose of studying the Bible? Fellowship with Jesus. Friendship with Jesus. What's the purpose of studying the Bible? Friendship. What's the purpose of studying the Bible? Friend. Is the purpose just to get facts? Well, then you don't want any facts. You don't want no facts? No, we need facts, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is what? Friendship. All together. What is the first great purpose if we're going to stu study and understand the Bible? Friendship with Jesus. All right? What is the second purpose? Go to John 17. Go to John 17. John 17. What is the second great purpose for studying the Bible? John 17. John 17, we're going to begin in verse 3. John 17, verse 3. And we'll notice again the very first principle, and then we'll see the second principle. John 17, beginning in verse 3. What does verse 3 say? The Bible says, and this is what? Life eternal. Now remember, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have what? But these are they that what? So what really is eternal life? Is eternal life just living forever? Is that eternal life? Uh, what is really eternal life? Talk to me, somebody. What is really eternal? Based on the text. What is really eternal life? Knowing Jesus. The Bible says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the first purpose of studying the Bible is to be brought into a fellowship with Jesus where I know him. That's the first purpose. This fellowship where I know him. If we don't know him, we're lost. The Bible says, many will say, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I've done many wonderful things. But Jesus will say, I what? I know you not. So when we study with the right posture, the right attitude, the purpose of it is so that, that as we study with this right attitude and posture of meekness and lowliness, that we can find a friendship and a fellowship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Do you see that? 
you know that's, that's why it's important when you start off and you pray? It might be important to tell God. I tell him. I, I, I make sure it's not a routine. Every morning I wake up and I say, Lord, please help this not just to be routine. I don't want to just be studying because every morning I'm supposed to do devotion. Lord, please don't do this. Help me to have a real experience with Jesus. You've got to pray like this in the morning. That's the first part. Open my eyes to see Jesus like I've never seen him before. And we see a new beauty in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. All right? First, the first point says, knowing this fellowship with Christ. And number four, verse four. What does verse four say? The verse four says, I have what? I have glorified thee on the earth. I have what? Finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What do you think is the second purpose for studying the Bible? First, friendship where I know Christ. What's the second great purpose of studying the Bible? Finish the work. Praise God. What's the second great purpose? Do you know that many Christians, when they study the Bible, you think they're studying to finish the work? Do you think so? Do you think that most Christians, when they study the Bible, they're studying to finish the work? Do you think so? They don't even know anything about finished work. They think it was all finished where? At the cross. Do you think that Jesus studied the Bible to finish the work? Yes or no? Do you know that every time that Jesus studied the Bible, that was his great purpose, he knew that it was time to finish the work. In fact, everything he did was this. John 17 says this. John 17, verse 4 says, I have finished the work which God gave us me to do. In fact, you remember when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well in John 4? He was talking to the woman at the well. And what did he say to her? Let's go back to John 4. Let's go there, John 4. Let's go back to John 4. John 4. Now I'm going to read this from Steps to Christ, but you're going to John 4. Steps to Christ, page 78. Hold your thumb in John 4 as soon as you get there. Write that down in your notes and hold your thumb there. And then we're going to read from Steps to Christ. I'm taking my time so you have enough time to write it down. And then you have enough time to look and we'll come back to it. John chapter 4. Is everybody there? Amen. All right, John, let's read Steps to Christ first, and then we'll come to John 4. From the screen, what does Steps to Christ say? Steps to Christ, page 78. It says, he said, let's read together. It says what? The what? Son of, Son of man came, came not to be ministered unto, but to what? Minister. minister. And to give his life a what? Ransom for many. This was the, not great. It says, this is the what? One. What does one mean? What does the one mean? Single. Remember, there's to be a singleness of purpose when we study the word of God. It says, this was the one great object of his what? Everything else was what? Secondary and subservient. Sub means it was placed underneath. It says, everything else was secondary and subservient. It was his meat and drink to do what? The will of God and to do what? To do what? Finish his work. Self and self-interest had no part in his labor. So what was the one great object of the ministry of Christ? It was to do what? Finish the work. So if we're studying the Bible, not only should we be looking for fellowship and friendship, but then our great goal should be, how can I study the Bible in such a way as to do what? Finish the work. Now, do you know there's actually a certain way to study the Bible in order to finish the work? And we're going to see that in just a moment. There's a particular way to study the Bible in order to finish the work. Now, is that in the Bible what we just read? Is that in the Bible? That's in the Bible. Now, does that, one of these, one of the texts is right here. Remember, when you study the spirit of prophecy, if a text is quoted, what should I do? Write down the text and go and find it. And write it down. One text is quoted. Matthew 20, verse 28, is talking about his ministry, his work. But then it says, it was his meat and drink to do the will of God and to finish his work. Is that a text that it was his meat and, to, meat and drink to do the will of God? Is that a Bible text? So then what should we do? If we're, I might say, that sounds like a Bible text. Let me see if I can find that in the Bible. John chapter 4. Look at what it says. John 4, beginning in verse 34. Here's the woman at the well. You remember the disciples are trying to get him food. Then Jesus says, uh, Jesus said in verse 32, but he said unto me, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Verse 33 says, therefore said the disciples one to another, have any man brought him aught to eat? It's amazing. The disciples never fully understood <laughs> Jesus has multiplied bread to feed 5,000 besides women and children. And now they think maybe somebody else has fed him. That's not what Jesus was talking about. You know, sometimes we're so slow to understand. Is that right? Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the Bible says, the disciples said, oh, no, he's mad because we didn't bring bread. No. You're not talking about bread. Jesus is talking about something else. So what, what do you mean when he said, I have meat that you know not of? Look at the next verse. Verse uh, 34 says, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to do what? So when we study the Bible, we should be studying with the purpose of knowing what? 
finishing the work. Now, I thought I said one purpose. So what is the one purpose? Uh, no, the one purpose is friendship. What is the one purpose? No, finish the work. I thought you said friendship. I did. I, both of them. The two have become what? One. In John 17, 3 and 4, we see first friendship, then finish the work, and the two have become one. Just like a marriage. We're to take these two principles. We're to take these two principles, and we're to see this. We're told the 17th chapter of John, which con contains this prayer, comprehends more than any other chapter in the New Testament. We see fellowship in John 17, and we see what? Finishing the work. And we must make the two become what? So we should be getting a friendship with Christ and learning this so that we can do what? Finish the work. Just one thing. And when you teach someone else, the same thing. This is, that should be our singleness of purpose that these two should become one. Now, on the cross of Calvary, what was the last thing that Jesus said on the cross? What was the last thing Jesus said? It is finished. Nothing else was more important than Jesus than finishing the work. Then at seven at Venice, what should be more important to us than this? What should be more important? Nothing. We've got to go back and find out then how to finish this work. All right, let's pass on that. Now, look at this. So, pack C. P, what's the P stand for? Prayer. Prayer. What does the A stand for? Attitude and what type of attitude? Meekness, humble, teachable. What type of purpose? Friendship and finishing the work. This should be my purpose. Now I'm ready to enter. Once I've done that, I'm ready to enter now to a method of using. Once I know the mission now, I'm ready to use a method. Are you with me? And C tells us that. What do you think the C stands for? Go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 2. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to notice something now. We're talking about how Jesus teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to begin now in verse 13. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13. In fact, let's back up. Let's back up to verse 10. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. And we're finding out now what does the C represent. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. Am I going too fast? Are we understanding? Is, 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 is the Bible sweet? Yes. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 10. Let's read that together. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. What does it say? It says, But God hath what? Revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the what? So if I'm going to get deep into the Scriptures, do I do it with my human intellect? Yes or no? Do I do it with my human intellect? No. Who is it that gets deep in the Scriptures? The Holy Spirit. And then I must pray for the Holy Spirit to teach me. Are you with me? And then when the Holy Spirit is teaching me, the Holy Spirit will take me deep into the Word of God. Now, how is he going to take me deep into the Word of God? What is he going to do? Jump down to verse 13. How is the Holy Spirit going to take me deep? Is he going to, is he going to do like this? Watch me now. What is he going to do like this? Is he going to walk over and say, okay, now you're deep. Is that how he's going to do it? How is he going to do it? Because some people say, well, I want to get deep. I want the Holy Spirit to teach me. But they don't know how the Holy Spirit teaches and so as a result, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something that the Holy Spirit would never do. The Holy Spirit's not going to just drop information in your mind. Some people stay home and they're waiting for osmosis approach of studying the Bible. They're sitting here making no effort. And they put the Bible in, maybe just listen to it on, on their iPhones or their, on their, their devices, and they think it's just going to jump into the brain. No, the Bible doesn't work that way. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us how the Holy Spirit teaches us. But it's still the Holy Spirit. Verse 13. Verse 13, what does it say? Verse 13 says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. Now, notice the difference. There's a difference between theology, man's teaching of the Bible, and God's teaching of the Bible. So the Bible says, not the way the man wisdom teacheth, but which the what? Holy Ghost teacheth. How does the Holy Ghost teach? Comparing what? spiritual things with what? So when the Holy Spirit teaches us, he's not going to just hit us over the head. How's the Holy Spirit going to teach us? He's going to teach us to do what? Compare what? Spiritual things with spiritual things. What do you think the C represents? Compare. How's this going to work? What do you mean compare? How does that, what are you talking about? This is the method. Now, do you know that today, what I'm getting ready to show you, but I want you to understand something. What I'm getting ready to show you that our theological schools, every theological school in Seventh-day Adventist today and Seventh-day Adventism near and far teach you that this is not the approach to use to study the Bible. 
Now that should make your eyes raise up. What we're going to show you that this is actually called the proof text method in the scholarly world. And they hate it. The scholars, theologians said, this is not the way. We must use exegesis. We need the Hebrew. We need the Greek. But that's man's wisdom. The Holy Spirit teaches us by comparing spiritual with spiritual. A child can do this. A person never going to school can do this. And this is why the Bible was given to us, as we shall see. But this is called the proof taking message. I want to show you, though, that the Bible teaches us that this is the method to use to understand itself. Who are you going to believe, man or God? I believe the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than man. Now, everybody here say God. I guess everybody here wanted to believe man. <laughs> now, that's all right. Now, it means that we're going to obey God rather than what? Man. Now, watch. Counselor teachers, parents, and students, page 437. I love great controversy, but the principle is there. But this is counsels to parents, teachers, and students, CT 437. Now, this is a powerful uh, quotation. Let's read this slowly. There's a lot of good, good truths in this. Now, after I finish, then I open up the floor for questions. Now, look at what this says. This says, let's read it slowly. The jewels of what? Truth lie scattered over the field of what? Now, that's not just talking about just Revelation, Revelation, the book of Revelation. This is talking about all of the Bible is a revelation of God to man. So it's talking about the inspired words from Genesis to Revelation. Nature and revelation alike testify that God's love. Talking about inspiration. So it says, the Jews of truth lie scattered over the field of revelation. In other words, over all of inspiration from Genesis to Revelation. So the Bible is the treasure. Jesus gave a parable about hidden treasure. But tell me something. In the Bible, the since sin came into the world, after sin, treasure, does it lie on the surface of the Bible? Uh, treasure, does it lie on the surface of the ground or underneath the ground? When people find treasure today, where do they have to go in order to find treasure? They have to go where? So where do we have to go in the Bible after sin in order to find treasure? Now you'll find out before sin, treasure was actually on the surface of the ground, both naturally and spiritually. They didn't have to go far to learn truth in the Bible uh, through the word of God, that it was on the surface. But after sin, God took the treasures and buried it beneath the ground. There was a reason for that, but we're not studying that just now. But now it says, the jewels of truth lie scattered over the field. If you go to Genesis, it will talk about the gold on the, on the ground, all that. But after sin, this has changed. The Jews of truth lie scattered over the field of revelation. But they have been buried beneath human what? Traditions. Beneath the sayings and commandments of what? Men. And the wisdom from heaven has been practically what? So man has ignored God's wisdom and has accepted the wisdom of this earth. It says, Satan, Satan has succeeded in making the world believe that the words and achievements are men uh, of great consequence. There are veins of truth yet to be what? Discovered. But spiritual things are what? Is that in the Bible? Where? 1 Corinthians 2. Where in 1 Corinthians 2? Look back down, look back down now. Look, look, say, look at verse 14. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Remember, when the Spirit of God quotes a text, look for the text. And I didn't say the text there, but I always study this this way. Find the text. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. I'm reading 1 Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. How do you spiritually discern? Verse 13 says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Why? Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So it says, there are veins of truth yet to be discovered. Council of Teachers, page 437, paragraph 2. It says, but spiritual things are spiritually discerned. How are we going to do this? We've got to compare. It says, one passage of scripture will prove a what? Key to unlock what? Now think about this now. So every text, please don't read on. We're going to go there, but I, want you, I don't want you to miss this. As you read on, you can miss the point. Every text in the Bible is both a key and a door. I'm going to say it again. Every text in the Bible is both a key and a door. What does a key do? Unlock something to open something up. What does a door do? It opens up itself. So every text in the Bible can be opened up and every text in the Bible can be used to open up another text. Are you with me? So every text in the Bible is two things. Every text is a what? Is a what? Key and a what? Door. What does a key do? A key does what? So I can use one text to unlock another text, or that text can unlock the text that I'm using to unlock another text. Are you with me? 
So every text that I look at, when I read in Revelation chapter 12, and the Bible says, the dragon was wroth with the woman. In Revelation 12, 17. Now, what is a dragon? That, that text is a door. I need to open that up. Are you with me? What is a dragon? I must use another text now to open that door. Are you following me? So if I'm reading, the dragon was wrong for the woman, that is a door in and of itself. So my question would be then, what text can open up that text? I've got to find a text that's dealing with the same subject. Are you with me? But in Revelation chapter 12, there's another text. Revelation 12 verse 9 says, And that old serpent called the what? Devil and Satan. That old dragon. That old, let's look at that. Let's go there quickly. I want you to see this quickly. Now, we'll use some more examples on this. But I want you to see this. Revelation 12. Beginning in verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. Last verse in Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 17. It says in verse 17, it says, And the dragon was what? Wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. We'll stop there. Dragon. So here's the text. We want to open up that text. This text is a door. We need to open it up. What is the dragon? What is the dragon? Let's open it up. Go back to verse 9. The Bible says now we're going to use verse 9 as a door or a key. What are we going to use it as? As a key. Verse 17 is going to be a key or a door. A door. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? Every text is a key and a door. One text, you can use a text to open up another text, or you can use another text to open up that text you're looking at. Every text is a key and a door. Revelation verse 12 or 17, we're using that text as the door that is to be opened up. One thing that must be opened up in the text is what is a dragon. We're going to take another key of another text. In verse 7, the Bible says, um, 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 verse 9, the Bible says in verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out. Who is the dragon? That old serpent called the what? Devil and Satan. So we find out from this text that a dragon represents what? Satan or the devil. So now that opens up my text in Revelation 12, 17 because I know now what a dragon is. I'm not looking for an animal. I'm seeing that that dragon represents the devil. Does that make sense? I'm not talking about just the text, but what we're doing. <laughs> Praise God. Now every text is that way. We're going to see more examples of that. The same thing of that. That when we look at this, every text is that way. Now let's go back to the quotation and let's follow that. It says, there are veins of truth yet to be discovered, but spiritual things are to be spiritually discerned. One passage of scripture will prove a what? A key. Now, no, 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 that brother is a student right there, praise God. It says, will prove a key to unlock what? And in this way, what way? By taking one scripture to unlock what? And in this way, light is shed upon the hidden meaning of the word. So I don't get to understand the hidden meaning by just saying this is what it means. The way I get deep into the word of God, I let the spirit get deep. And then he goes from one text to another. And as I see it, the light shows me what's deep in God. And I go beneath the surface. The only way to go beneath the surface, you've got to break open the ground. You've got to break open the ground. Are you with me? We're going to show you about that in just a moment. By comparing, how am I going to, what am I going to do? Now, this is why one example is good. You know, there used to be a thing that children used to like to do. And I used to like when I was a child. They had these little uh, pictures, and they take one picture, and they'll say, compare the picture, show which one is missing. You remember seeing that as a child? They might have a man, and one person has a hat on and a scarf on and glasses on. He may have shoes on. But then one picture will have that, and then another picture says, what's missing? And then you look, and one person has one shoe, but he doesn't have another shoe on. The other picture, he has a, he has a, a scarf, but no hat. Are you following what I'm saying? And when you do that, you know what, you know what is, is being exercised? There was being exercised to look to compare. You know you need to do it with the scriptures. As you scripture, you compare and watch which one is there, which is not there. And do you know that if you study the book of nature, you learn this. If you study nature, it teaches you to look for things that are there and are missing. This is why Jesus spent much of his time with nature and with God. If you spend time in nature, your mind will be accustomed to detail. To what? Detail. To detail. When you do practical building and painting, your mind becomes, it becomes uh, focused on what? The practical trades as God gave us in nature was to get us focused on detail. Does anybody know how to build in this room? Anybody know how to build? It does a little bit of building. You do a little building, praise God. Now, does it matter if I look at a half inch if I'm, if I'm building something? Does it matter if I'm cutting a board and I want to fit it to a particular place? Does it matter if I miss a half inch? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Now, before, I didn't care about half inch, but when I started putting things together in building, putting the window on and so forth, I saw that half inch can make me have a window or not have a window. 
just that little hair breadth. And Jesus was a carpenter. This is to help us to pay attention to detail. Now, this says, by comparing different texts. Do I just look at any text? Mm -mm. By comparing different texts, treating on what? So if I want to understand the dragon, I look at all the texts that deal with the word what? Dragon. Now, every text is not going to open up. You give me keys. You have any keys with you? See, someone who leads the church normally always have keys. That <laughs> There's several keys on this, right? If I come to the door, is one key going to open up every door? So what if I go and I start studying the Bible and I put in one text or one scripture or one key and I turn it and it doesn't open up to me, then what do I do? I give up? No. You know what I do? I say that is not the key. I look for another text. Do you know that every text, for example, let's look at Revelation 12 again. And let's look at verse 7. Revelation 12, verse 7. Verse 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the what? That word dragon is there. So if I looked in my concordance, I could look up D, find dragon. I read here dragon. Does that tell me who the dragon is? No, it doesn't. Does that, dra does that, that use the word dragon? Same subject, but does that open up who the dragon is? No. But verse 9 opens up who the dragon is because it says the dragon is that old serpent called the devil. So verse 7 doesn't open up to me what the dragon is, but verse 9 opens up. How do I know when something opens up? How do I know when something opens up? If I gave you a key and say, go into that door and open it up, and when it opens up, you go in, do I have to tell you when you've gone into it, when, when you had the right key? Do I have to tell you when you had the right key? How do you know when you had the right key? When, you open, when it opens up. You will find out when your mind begins to open up and see the understanding, you don't even have to guess. You cannot be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. No one has to tell you when you go in your house and, and your eyes are closed. You only have two keys and, and your eyes are closed. You feel through and you put the key in and you look and it doesn't open up. And you try and try and no, no, no. Then you take the next key and you try and all of a sudden the door opens up. No one has to tell you the door opened up. That's the right key. You know it's the right key because the door does what? Opens. When you go to your car and you open up the door, you don't have to struggle. You put it in, it doesn't open up. You don't say, well, I wonder if this is the right key. I, I, I need somebody with a doctorate to tell me if it's the right key. No! Not somebody that has a degree in keys and key making to open up the door. Once you see the door open up, you know that that is the right key no matter what anyone says. Even if the key master said that's not the right key, you say, oh no, it opened to me. Do you understand? So now, let's see this. It says, by comparing different texts, treating on the same subject, viewing their bearing on what? And see, this is why you can't read qu quickly. When you study the Bible, you must read slowly. You must look at every word. You must watch how this word compares with that. Sometimes a word is missing. Sometimes there's a plural. Sometimes there's more to it. You've got to look at every word and see how it compares with the next. Who's going to help us join this? Is it because we're so greatly inte intellectual? The Holy Spirit will help us. If we have the right attitude and purpose. Now, this says, by comparing different texts, treating on the same subject, viewing their beauty bearing on every side, the true meaning of the scriptures will be made what? Evident. We hold these truths to be self what? In other words, the evidence is in itself to know that the door has opened up and that you've got the right scripture. Compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Does that include the spirit of prophecy? Yes or no? How do you know that it can include the spirit of prophecy? Say again. To the law and to the testament, that's true there, but remember, I'm testing you upon the very things that we're studying. We must learn to look at every what? Word. The Bible does not say here in 1 Corinthians 12 when it says comparing, comparing spiritual with spiritual. The Bible doesn't say simply text. It says comparing spiritual with spiritual. Is that right? Is the spirit of prophecy spiritual? Is the spirit of prophecy spiritual? How do we know? Because it's from the Holy Spirit. Is that right? That it's called spirit, meaning that it is what? Spiritual. It is the spirit of prophecy. So I can take the spirit of prophecy and help and compare it with the Bible and it will help me understand the Bible. I can take text. The Bible says comparing spiritual with spiritual, but first I must prove the spirit of prophecy is spiritual. And of course, the Bible does that. So we must learn to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Look at this one, Great Controversy 521. It says... In order to sustain erroneous doctrines or unchristian practices, some will seize upon passages of the scripture separated from the what? So another part of comparing is learning how to understand what? Context. So the C is not only compare, the C is compare and what else? Context. 
So someone can say, well, the law was nailed to the cross. Is there a text that says something similar to that? It doesn't say, it's nailed to, it doesn't say the law is nailed to the cross, but it says that something was nailed to the cross in Colossians. Is that right? But I've got to look at the context to find out which law was nailed to the cross. Are you with me? So the same thing, is, there's a text that says that the Sabbath, that, that, that no man re, regard of Sabbath days. Well, someone says, well, that means that the Sabbath is not important. Well, I've got to look at the what? Context that we're just talking about because there's more than one type of Sabbath. So I've got to go through the Bible and understand this. So it says, separated from the context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as proving the point. In other words, there's a text that says, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. I remember Jehovah's Witness came to my house and they said, look, you should love the Bible because the Bible says that you can have a little wine if you want some. Hey, this was the, that was the opening line. I said, that don't make me want to study the Bible. <laughs> I don't want no wine, either natural or spiritual. And so, not this false wine. So what does it mean when it says the wine? Is it all right? The Bible says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging and those who deceive thereby are not wise. Proverbs 20 verse 1. So which one is right? Both. But I've got to look at it in its proper what? Context. So when it says a little wine, what type of wine is it talking about? Is it talking about fermented wine? No. If you go back in the Bible, the Bible speaks of two different types of wine. The Bible speaks of old wine as you go in the Bible, and then the Bible speaks of new wine in Isaiah 66. And when you look and compare all those texts, you can see that the bad wine is not good for the stomach. It rages, bubbles, ferments, not no good. But the good wine, the new wine, it is good. For the stomach. That's the one that Jesus gave and the one he used. Are you following what I'm saying? All right. So it says, separate from his context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as proving their point, when the remaining portion would show the meaning to be quite the what? Opposite. With the cunning of the serpent, they entrench themselves behind disconnected utterances construed to suit their carnal desires. In other words, they don't want to do what's right, so they, they, they do it this way. But we've got to learn how the whole Bible is connected together. It says, thus do many what? Do many willfully pervert the word of God? Others who have an, an active imagination seize upon the figures and symbols of holy writ, interpret them to suit their what? So they don't let the symbols explain them. They say, I think I was talking to somebody and they said, well, a bear, that must represent Russia because Russia has the mascot of a bear. When the Soviet Union, it had the mascot of a bear. They said, well, then the bear has to be Russia. And so they went in the Bible, they saw a bear, Lion, leopard, they saw a bear, they said they had to be Russia. This is what a church literally teaches. And we were talking to someone from the, a particular church. And they said it must be Russia. Is that in the Bible? No. So these symbols are used for our fancy instead of letting the Bible explain itself. It says, with little regard to the testimony of the scripture as its own what? Interpreter. And then they present their vagaries as the teachings of the Bible. That's not the Bible teaching. That's your own interpretation of the Bible. We must let the Bible explain itself, comparing Scripture with Scripture, spiritual things with spiritual things. Now, my brothers and sisters, let's go to Proverbs. Let's get ready to bring out some final points. Let's go to Proverbs. And let's look at this. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, I think you know this text. Let me see if you can repeat it. If not, we'll look at it. But if you can repeat it with me, we won't go there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, study to show thyself approved. What's the next thing it says? A workman. Well, let's go there. Let's go there. Let's go there. All right, let's go to 2 Timothy 2. We're doing good. We're doing good, but I want us to see it. See, we've got to study with every word. I want us to see this. I thought, well, let's go to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Let's look at it carefully. It's very important. Now, we're going to illustrate again what we just talked about. And we're going deeper, though, in our study of this. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. What does the very first word say? Study. study. Now, do you know this is the only time in the Bible where the word uh, study, as it relates to Scripture, is used. There's another time when it says study, but it's talking about study to be quiet in Thessalonians. But and as it relates to the scripture, this is the only time in the Bible where that word study is. That means if we want to learn how to study the Bible, we've got to understand what this verse is saying. This is going to, we need to open up this verse now. This verse, we're going to use it not as a key yet. We're going to use this verse as a what? As a door in which to open it up. Because we want to learn how to study the Bible. Now, is reading the Bible and studying the Bible the exact same thing? No. Now, in order to study the Bible, I do have to read the Bible. But I must read, then search, then study. Search the scriptures, read the scriptures, study the scriptures. All of these are brought to view in the Bible. So uh, reading is necessary 
to search, and searching is necessary to study, but studying is the final objective of the process of study. Now, what does study mean? How is it that I can read the Bible and not study the Bible? Well, we've got to look at what is in this text to open it up. There's something I must do with the scripture in order to study it, not just read it. Verse 15, let's read it together slowly. First it says what? Study. Now, what happens if you chew your food too fast? It goes in, but it doesn't benefit. Is that right? What happens if I study the Bible and read it too quickly? Do I really understand what I read? Study to show somebody else approved. Study to show what? Thyself approved, not unto man, but unto whom? Unto God. A workman. So this study has something to do with the work that must be done. Now we've got to finish the work. Is that right? But study to show thyself approved a work man. So a, a work man is a man that does what? So what is the work that we're supposed to do? What is one of the works that we're supposed to do in this verse? Uh, in the verse, in the verse. What is one of the works we're supposed to do in the verse? What'd you say? In one word, in one word. What is one, what, in one word? Study. So the work is to do what? Study. So it says study to show that self approved a work man. So when a man studies, he is now becoming a what? Work man. Now this is so important. You know the Bible says that if a man doesn't work, neither should he what? Eat. You know why pe many people have not spiritually been able to eat the word of God? They don't know how to study. So as a result of not knowing how to study, they have not done the work that would allow them to do what? Eat. Studying the Bible is like preparing the food, but that's not eating the food. What would happen if you never had food prepared for you? Could you eat it? No. And so most people today have never learned how to prepare food. They have never gone through a spiritual cooking class or a food preparation class. And so they're dying of spiritual malnutrition. There's a famine in the land because nobody knows how to cook. You know, it would be a terrible thing if mothers didn't know how to cook food. Amen. Young boys and young girls would be starving. Husbands would be starving unless he knew how to cook for himself. But God wanted it to be this way. So we've got to learn how to prepare food. Does that make sense? Study is this word. Study to show thyself approved a workman that needeth not to be what? So that when you study, you shouldn't be ashamed to say, well, this is what I got, but I'm not sure if it's right or wrong. I don't know. You're a theologian. I'm not. What you say must be right. What I say is wrong. I'm a common person. You're a pastor. Is that what the Bible teaches? The Bible says you need not be ashamed. Jesus never went to a school of theology in this world, but he stood before the brightest and keenest mind of his nations who were crafty and hypocritical, but Jesus never once lost in his explanation of the scriptures. Even though who have spent their whole life in studying, their whole life as doctors of the law, Jesus humbly but unashamedly said, no, the scripture does not mean that, it means this. You have heard it said, but I say unto you, it is written. Can we talk with the same authority? He left us an example that we should what? Follow his steps. Brothers and sisters, this is what God is trying to show us right now. That God wants us to have that authority. Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus taught not as the scribes and the Pharisees, but as one having authority. He knew what was written, and so should we. Now, we can only do that when we learn how to study. What is this study? What's the last part? What is the work? Study is the work. What is the work? I'm talking about the text. Remember, always let the text explain what, the, what it, the answer is. I'm not asking to put anything in it. Don't add, don't take away. Everything we say, we're just letting the text talk to us. S study means it is the work. What is the work? It says, a workman that need not be ashamed. What? So what is the work? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the word of truth is not the word because the word of truth is just the word of truth. But I must learn how to not just divide it, I must learn how to do what? What does it mean to divide? What does that mean? To, 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 to be able to break it open. Now imagine, if, if I'm going to get beneath the surface of the, of the ground, what do, what do you call that when, when this person is getting ready, they call that, what type of, what do they do to the ground when they're getting ready to go beneath the ground? They call it ground breaking. They're breaking the ground. And so in order to, 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 to get, into the, get deep into the, the scriptures, if I'm going to go into the ground and get the treasure that's beneath the surface, I need to pray, I need to have the right attitude, Ming of the pastor, I must know the method. And when I get ready to do this, I've got to get beneath the surface. I've got to be able to break open the ground. Are you with me? So if I do not learn how to divide the scripture, have I studied yet? I've not done the work. I may be reading, but I'm not what? Studying says I have rightly what? Divided. Have you done that work? Now, do you know that you cannot use 
man's wisdom to divine the word of God. And that's what people think is study is they're using men's wisdom, his idea, his exegesis, and they use that. But that's not what the Bible, do you know, there's a saying talking about a diamond. There's something about a diamond, about cutting a diamond. Anybody know the saying about the diamond? Only, only a diamond can cut a diamond. That a diamond is so strong. You know, the right now today, when they, when they, you know, you have mountains and they put rows through mountains. You know, if you use metal, the metal will break. It's, it's not strong enough. But you know what they do? They take, with this, they, they take the, a pointed end. They take these diamonds and they put the diamonds on the end of these drills and the diamond can cut, cut straight through the rock. There, there's not many substances stronger than a diamond. A di only a diamond can cut a what? Now, do you know that the word of God is just like that? Do you know that you cannot break open the word of God without the word of God? Only the Bible can divide the Bible. Are you following me? What if I use my human intellect to try to divide the Bible? It would say, sorry, not strong enough. <laughs> Just as metal would bend, you ever been in the ground? I've been in the ground. The ground been so hard, I took my pitchfork to break into the ground. I went in to get ready to get the garden. When I first started, the ground was so hard, it bent the fork. Literally. It wasn't strong enough. Do you know that this human intellect is not strong enough to divide the word of God? Go to John 10. Let, now we're going to open up this text. John 10. John 10, let's go quickly, John 10, as we bring these final points to a close. John 10. And we're going to begin in John 10. We're going to begin in John 10 and verse 35. Now, remember, we're looking at the context of the Word of God. We're looking at this context of comparing Scripture. Now, we're trying to find out how to divide the Word of God, how to break it open. Are you with me? Are you with me? Praise God. John 10, verse 35. Let's read this together. Verse 35 says... If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be what? Cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be what? So how can I divide the word of God if the scriptures cannot be what? How can I divide something that cannot be broken? You say break it down. Make me understand it. Explain it. How can I break down the word of God if the scriptures cannot be broken? That means that it's impossible to study the word of God. Is that true? No. <laughs> It says the scriptures cannot be broken, but the scriptures cannot be broken by man. Is there something that can break the scriptures? Is there something that can divide and break open the scriptures? Go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Now we're going text upon text, line upon line. We're letting the scriptures explain itself. There's only one thing strong enough to divide the scriptures, to break the scriptures, and not let the scriptures be broken. What do you mean? In other words, broken means it's not true. So what this is saying is the scriptures can break open itself and yet still allow it to be true. How can it do this so that we can understand it? The Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that there's only one thing in the world that's strong enough that can divide the spiritual nature of the word of God. The Bible says the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We're in Hebrews 4 and we're noticing now verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. What does Hebrews 4, verse 12 say? Let's read that. Verse 12 says what? For the word of God is, what is that word quick? Does that mean it's fast? Is that what it's talking about? Does that word quick mean that it's fast? No. That word quick mean that it has life in it. Both the quick and the dead, the Bible says. That means life. So it says, that's why we need a dictionary sometimes. But it says, for the word of God is quick and what else? powerful and what's the next word sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of what so it can cut spears in sunder it can divide asunder of soul and what else spirit what is strong enough to divide spiritual things the word of god and the joints and marrow and is a discerner, spiritual thing is spiritually discerned. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So only the word of God is strong enough to divide asunder the word of God and still allow it to stay united and not destroy the scriptures. If you do that with your brain trying to break it apart, you will destroy the Bible. The only thing strong enough to do that and keep it intact, I must allow the Bible to be its own interpreter. The Bible must divide and explain the Bible. and then It doesn't destroy the Bible. It keeps it intact when the Bible explains itself. Does that make sense? Now, do you notice we were using the Bible to explain itself? Did I say anything or did the Bible say that? The Bible said that. Now, we'll close with one last thought on that very point. 
Go back to Proverbs 2 now. We're closing, summing up everything we said. So we're talking about how to study the Bible. How to read us now. We found out that the uh, acronym was used to do this. The acronym is what? What's the acronym? Pack your Bible. Pack B. What are the four letters? P, A, C, and B. What are the four letters? 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 Good. All together. P-A-C-B. That's an acronym. It means something else. The P stands for what? Prayer. Never open up the Bible without prayer. The A stands for what? Attitude and purpose. When I want to study the Bible, I don't go to the mechanics first. First, my attitude. What is the attitude I should have? Meek. Humble, lowly, teachable. Not saying the Bible shouldn't mean that. I, don't, I, I want to make the Bible mean that, whether it's diet or dress or education. No. What does the Bible say? And reason, our understanding bows that whatever you say, Lord, speak, thy servant heareth. We're like little sheep. Attitude, purpose. What is the purpose? Two great purposes have become one. What is the purpose? Number one, I study what? So I can see Jesus. To bring me into fellowship, friendship, where I know Jesus as a friend, I must study, not just to get information, not just knowledge, but I want to find friendship with Jesus. Finally, I study to finish the work. Because the work needs to be finished. In 2015, we're in the last generation. We need to understand this quickly to get this experience, not only so we can be ready, but there's a great work that must be done in a little time. C stands for what? Compare. Compare what? Compare spiritual things with spiritual things, text with text. What about the spirit of prophecy? It is also what? Spiritual. So the Bible and spirit of prophecy, law and testimony, I compare it. And also, when I compare, I look at the what? Context. Making sure it's the same subject, talking about the same things. And then when it opens up to me, I know that it is opened up because the scripture, the Bible, the text are both a door and a key at the same time. Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2. That's beginning in verse 2. Proverbs 2. This is how God teaches us from the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. All right, Proverbs 2, beginning in verse 2. Let's look at it together. Proverbs 2, verse 2. What does it say? The Bible says, let's read it together, verse 2. It says, So that thou what? Incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understand. Do you want to understand the scriptures? How readest thou? Let's see. Verse 3 says, yea, what's the next word after yea? What's the next word after yea? What's the word after yea? Uh, yeah? If. What does if suggest? Condition. Now, what we're getting ready to show you is that in order to get understanding from the scriptures, there are conditions. And we've already studied the conditions, but we're going to see it again from the Bible. So the Bible says, if you're going to understand, if your heart is going to get wisdom and understanding, verse 3 says, yea, if Thou, what's the first word? Criest after knowledge and lifted up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for her treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of what? God. For the Lord giveth wisdom and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Is it conditional how we're going to get this knowledge and wisdom from the word of God? If then, so somebody says, well, then I want this knowledge and understanding from the word of God, but it's conditional. If then, if you don't do this, then someone says, well, I will give you this. If you are on time to study every day, I will give you this. Well, what if you're not on time? Do you get that? No, if then. So right here, the Bible has given us a condition to get this knowledge from the word of God. There were two conditions that the Bible brought out here. Anybody find out what, the, what was the first condition? Back in verse three, what was the first condition? Yea, if what? What is crying? What is that talking about? Does that mean crying? Oh, Lord, I want to understand the Bible. Is that what it's talking about? The Bible says in Psalm 55, 17. Remember, when you tell me an answer, your mind should be, even if you don't go there all the time, your mind should be thinking of another text. Because this text is both a key and a what? What does it mean to cry in the Bible? Because that word cry is used many times in the Bible. Psalms 55, 17. You may know it. But if you don't, write it down. But Psalms 55, 17 says... Evening, morning, and at noon shall I pray and cry aloud. So crying is to do what? It's an earnest praying. 
Give ear unto my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. And then he begins talking. Psalms 5, it talks about the crying to the Lord. This crying is talking about earnest prayer. Not just a crying where you're just praying with words. It's a heartfelt prayer. So in, Psalm, in Proverbs 2, if I'm going to get an understanding from the Word of God, number one, I must enter into a heartfelt prayer. What if I just say, Lord, open my eyes. I want to open up the Word of God and understand it. Is that, is that necessarily crying? It must be a heartfelt prayer. So it says, If thou criest at the knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, so that means before you can understand, you must first pray. Then verse 4 says, is that, is that the only condition? Just pray and God's going to show me everything. Is that right? Or do we have a part? Do we have a part? Everything God does, God makes man a, part, a partner in cooperation and we work together. Verse 4 says, If thou what? Seek and you shall find. You must search the scriptures. Seek in the scriptures. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures. If thou search her, how am I going to search her? As silver. How do I search for silver on top of the ground? I heard somebody say, seekest her as silver and searches, talking about search the scriptures, telling us how to search the scriptures, and searches for her as for hid treasures. So once I learn how to search for hid treasures, I learn how to search the Bible. Are you with me? How do you search for hid treasures? Huh? Dig. Does the Bible say that? Wouldn't that, be a good, wouldn't that be a good wonder? I wonder, what would I do if I was going to find this? And I'm letting, letting you help me. If I wanted to find this out and search for us for dig treasure, what might be one thing I could look for in my concordance? Because I don't know all the scriptures in my mind. If I want to open up this verse now, I want to open up, what does it mean when it says, search is for her, as for hid treasure? What might I look up? Search is one way. What is another thing I might look up? Hid is another way because it says, search is for her, as for Head treasure. In fact, let's look at that. Let's go to Job. Job chapter 3. Now I'm illustrating what we've been talking about. Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. We want to learn because this is what it means to study. This is the condition of getting this wisdom from God. We're going to Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. And we want to find out, not me saying it, we want the Bible to interpret and explain itself. We're comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Scripture with scripture. Job chapter 3. How do we search for silver or for hidden treasure. Job chapter 3, we want to read in verse 20 and 21. Job 3, beginning in verse 20. Job 3 verse 20 says, wherefore is light. Are we all there? Let's read that together. It says in verse 20, Job 3 verse 20, wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life unto the what? Do you want life? Yes or no? In the scriptures, you think you have eternal life, but these are they that testify of me. Verse 21, let's read it slowly and carefully, and I want you to tell me why we're reading this verse. Verse 21 says, which long for what? Death, but cometh not, and what? Dig for it more than for what? It treasures. Why did I read that verse? Why did I read it? Talk to me, somebody. So it shows me how to search. And the way that I search for hidden treasures is by what? Digging. And the way I dig is by breaking open the ground. And the way I break open the scripture is by using simply Hebrew and Greek in my mind. Is that why? No. I let the scripture explain it what? Itself. And you will find that the Hebrew and Greek, if you study it right, would say the same thing that the Bible says when it explains itself. So that the scholar and the common person will come to the same thing. Let me get ready to bring it to a close. Here's the hidden treasure. You watch the hidden treasure? Remember Jesus gave the parable? If you were to read Christ's object lessons, Jesus gave a parable about hidden treasure. And in the parable, in Christ's object lesson, it says the treasure is the word of God. The field. Now, it's also Jesus, but from the stamp on the Bible, it says that the field. And then it says the treasures, the truths beneath the surface of the scriptures. Now, here's the man digging for treasure. Now, let's look at this hole. He's digging beneath the ground. He's trying to find something. Watch, watch when we dig right. Watch the ground. We read this. We're talking about this. We don't, it says here, by the introduction of fall, it says, when the shaking comes by the introduction of what? These surface readers anchored nowhere are like the shifting sand. You know, the surface readers will be lost unless we learn how to dig what? And get beneath the surface of the scriptures. That's what we're talking about how to do. Then it says, we do not go deep enough in our what? Does the spirit prophecy in the Bible say the same thing? Yes. We got to go dig deeper. We got to dig deeper. Now watch this now. Watch the treasure. When we dig, what's going to take place? 
hidden treasure comes out of the ground. And in the Bible, where it only looked like a dead book, and when I look in the Bible, I see treasure. I'm saying, Lord, man, sometimes I'm working, I'm doing something, and boom, I understand. I said, Lord, that was powerful. Sometimes I'm washing the dishes, and the Holy Spirit will put a text in my mind. My hands are wet. I run out in the wet, wet hands, writing notes down from what God has told me. It's amazing what God will teach us. It's beautiful. My brothers and sisters, hidden treasure from the Word of God, but you've got to have a what? Key. And the Scripture unlocks the Scripture. We read that already. The plan of redemption, though, is the what? From Genesis to Revelation, the plan of redemption is the what? Key. Remember we read that? It says, he will grant his thoughts before him an infinite field for study. He has the key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's word. So in the Bible, the best thing that's going to help me to study the Bible and use every key and every door is when I understand the plan of what? Now, has anybody ever put together a puzzle before? You ever put together a puzzle before? This is how it's like. Let me show you how it works. I'm going to pass on this right now. We find out here's the, the world's largest what? Jigsaw puzzle. And this is literal. Uh, they had the, the world's largest jigsaw. Here's a man right here. The Lord, he put it together. It filled his whole side of his wall. It was over, it was over a 25,000 piece puzzle. It took him almost a year to put it together. He went into the book of world, world, world records for putting it together a few years back. I believe it was in 2008. Now, how, before I look, show you, how do you think that when you put together a puzzle, do you put the pieces down? Do you, how, do, how do you put together a puzzle? If you were going to put together a puzzle, what would you do? I can't hear you. The edges and corners? Okay, good. Edges and corners? Someone else. But you're going, you're going, you're going to find out that there's a, you're going to find out you, you wouldn't be able to put the edges and the corners down first. First, you dump out the what? The pieces. You, before you put the puzzle together, you've got to put the pieces out so you can arrange them. You put the pieces all the way out there, and you stir the pieces out, and you put them out there. Then once the pieces are dumped out, then what do you do? What did you say? You see a picture, is that right? You look at the picture of what you're trying to put together. If you don't know what you're putting together, you're going to have a hard time putting that piece together. You may be putting together a, 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 a flowery scene or a, a building. You don't know what you're putting together unless you put it there. Now watch this now. Let's look at it demonstrate. Here's a puzzle right here. What, what do you notice about this? What do you see? They dumped all the pieces where? Now, they put some corners together, just like my brother said, but they first dumped it out on the table. And then what do they have here? A picture. Now, why do they have a picture? What is the picture helping them to do? The, help, the picture helps to see what they're actually searching for. How do you know what piece? You say, oh, man, I'm supposed to have a little, a, a little flower there. So you go into the pieces and you search for that piece. Are you following me? Then you put it there. So you're searching the screen, You search for that piece and you, then you put it there. Now, my brothers and sisters, as in the natural, so in the what? Now, watch this. You watch it? You watch it? That's the pieces. What do you think the pieces represent spiritually? Every passage of the Bible is a piece of the what? Puzzle. The Bible texts are puzzles, keys and doors, another symbol. So the Bible says a puzzle. You're trying to put together a picture. Are you with me? So here are the puzzle here. And there are principles in that, but I'm going to pass on that. We, we look, pack your Bible. There's a method, it's comparing, etc. But then you have to have a picture. What is the picture that you use in order to put the text or the picture together from the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? What is the picture that we use to really understand what we're searching for in the Bible? There's a picture that goes all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the plan of redemption. And what picture illustrates the plan of redemption? The sanctuary with its three places. So look at the picture. Are you looking at the picture? What do you see? So now you can put the pieces together once you understand the sanctuary. And you'll find out, you go to the Bible, and you can't understand the Bible without the key, and you see all this text, and this is why other denominations, they see all this text, but they don't know how to put the picture together. Tonight, we're going to show you how to put the picture together. So you're going to understand more tonight when we study. Tonight, we're going to actually show you that the reason why we can know the final generation is because we have the picture, and we know how to put it together. So although I'm telling you this, I know a picture, and I'm looking at the picture, and we're going to put the picture together, and we're going to actually see this means that the picture, can you tell me when the puzzle's almost finished? When you see all the pictures come together, you can see when there's only one more piece, and you can actually see it. We're going to show you in 2015, this is the last generation. There's only one more generation to complete this picture. And we are that generation. So this is why we must do it that way. I'm going to open up now. We're going to get ready to close. I want to open up for questioning now. You should say there's one letter I didn't tell you. Is that right? That B. We'll close on that. 
but now I want to open up the floor. We'll just take a few minutes if there's any questions concerning what we have studied, and then we'll close on B. The very first scripture was, class, what was the very first scripture that we used? It was talking about prayer. What was the very first scripture that we used? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. What did it say? That we're to be careful for what? Nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. So that means we do nothing without prayer. All right, good, thank you. And any other question? Yes. That's a very good question. You say, what, what about women's ordination? Now, the first thing is to see, is women's ordination in the Bible, yes or no? So if it's in the Bible, women's ordination, then what we have to do is find out where does that piece of the puzzle fit? Are you following me? Now, what is wrong with women's ordination? Let's go to Mark for in a moment. Let's look at the text for a moment, quickly. Mark chapter 3. Is the, the scripture is not explained. You'll find not, the scripture is not being used to explain scripture. Some people may use their language and they may try to go and say, well, I studied this in Hebrew and I studied this in Greek, but it's not based on the picture. Now, Mark chapter 3, you're going to find out something. Now, I'm using this to bring out a point, but we find out that ordination itself does come from the Bible. Nothing wrong with ordination. The Bible says in verse 14, the Bible says, and he ordained 12 that they should, Mark 3, Mark 3, verse 14. Mark 3, verse 14, it says, And he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Now, it's talking about ordination. Now, question. Ordination itself is not, what is, does anybody know what ordination means? What does ordination mean? What does orda ordination mean? When God ordains something, what does ordination mean? That somebody has been selected to do something. Women, there's nothing wrong with women's ordination. There's nothing wrong with that. Has not God selected women to do anything? Yes or no? Has not God ordained women throughout the Bible? Yes or no? So what people are doing, they're confusing the issue. The issue is not women's ordination. That's not the issue. Women have been ordained for several things. Have God ordained women to do certain things? Yes or no? What are some of the things that women have been ordained to do? Talk to me. Women have ordained to be helpmeets. Man can't be a helpmeet for another man. Now, they're trying very hard in today, but a man can't be another helpmeet to another man. That's homosexuality. The Bible says it's an abomination. You can't do that. But a woman's role is to do that. Are you with me? This is a woman's ordination, to be, to be a helpmeet like that for a man as well, husband and wife. What is another or, or thing that a woman has been ordained to do? To be a mother. Does the Bible speak of that? A man can't do that. A man cannot be a mother. There are roles, physiological roles, spiritual roles that are in the Bible. And we must understand that. Does the Bible set up a spiritual rule for the home? Yes or no? Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go now. So the first thing we need to find out is God is not against women's ordination. See, the devil is tricky. He's tricky. The devil will say, oh, see, you're just against women. You're against women. No, God has ordained women. In fact, the prophet says that women's job is more sacred and holy than that of a man. So it's not a less job. You'll find out sometimes that the Bible says that the weaker vessel, that the weaker instrument in 1 Corinthians is sometimes of more necessity than the smaller instrument. First Corinthians talk about the body parts and how we can't say we don't have need of this one and that. But look at Genesis 3. The Bible says that God set up the home. Now in Genesis chapter 3, God made the head of the home beginning in verse 16. The Bible says in Genesis 3 verse 16, it says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall do what? He shall do what? Does the Bible set up who is to be the ruler of a home, yes or no? Now, you're going to find out the reason why there are problems in the church is because there's problems where? In the home. Adventist home, page 15, says that the success of the church depends upon the home. The reason why we don't understand the roles of the church is because we have lost sight of understanding the roles of the home. Christian home is the secret to our problems in the church. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy. We found out the Bible gives us a role for the home. Does God anywhere in the Bible ordain a woman to rule over a man in the home? Anywhere in the Bible? 
you will never find that anywhere in the Bible. Do you know that even a prophet in the Bible, do you know that if you study the Bible and you study his inspiration, that when a prophet was a woman, that they were still under subjection to the husband, even in the Bible when they were prophets? They were Bible, they were Bible prophets. If you go to the New Testament, you had Anna, and you, she was a prophetess, she was in the temple, she had a husband. You go back in and you go, you go back and look in Luke chapter 2, you'll see this. Do you know that Sister White said this with her mouth? She says, when God gives her light from heaven, she accepts it because it's God's light, not hers. But she says when it's a matter between her and her husband, she accepts the judgment of her husband. So this doesn't change the roles, even though God has ordained us. Prophets, pastors, etc., but there's still roles in the home. Now notice now what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. What does it say in 1 Timothy 3? Verse 1, it says, this is the true office if a man desire the office of a bishop. This is a pastor. He desire a good thing. A bishop must be blameless. The husband of what? One wife. Now, you want to find out that this is gender specific to have an office of a pastor. It says, husband of one wife. You know what they say today? Someone says, well, that's not what the text means. That it just means that, 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 that there's gender. So if it's a woman, she must be the wife of one what? Husband. It can just be turned around. That's what they say today. And the scholarship, but that's not what the text says. Let's read the rest of the text. Remember, Mr. says, we don't want to practice something, so we say we can't understand, even the theologian. But if we look back at what it says, the rest of the text explains the context. It says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given hospitality, apt to teach. Let's continue. Verse 4 says, one that does what? Ruleth. Well, his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. What does, who does God say should rule the house? Is that specific? The text explains itself. So that meant, there's not just talking about women or men. God never gave the man or the, or the woman the opportunity to rule the house when there's husbands and wives in the Christian home. This is a qualification. And this reason says that, why, why is this so? Why is this the case? Verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his what? Own house, he shall, how shall he take care of the church of God? And this is the problem with the church today. We've met, the Christian home has been messed up. And so as a result, we've lost an understanding of the roles of the church. So as we look back at this, it's plain from the Bible. Now we go back. Women have their role. Man have their role. Can a man fulfill the role of a woman? No. What if there's a separation in the home? And all of a sudden, the wife is left by herself. And there's no man in the house. But she lives in a place where there's cold. It's very cold. It's freezing. All she has is a wood stove to warm the house. But there's no father. Her children, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, all girls. Can they split wood and put it in the wood stove? Yes or no? No. But she has no man. She sits there and she freezes to death. Is that right? What does she do? She goes and splits the wood. So now she's a husband now. She's a man now. Is that right? She's still a woman. Is that right? Now she may do the work of a man, but she's still a what? Woman. She doesn't say, now nah, I'm splitting once, I'm a man. If she does, she's insane. She's lost her mind. But she doesn't do that if she's intelligent. She splits the work. She does the work of a man. What does this mean? Because there are places where no men are doing the work that's supposed to be in the church. What does a woman do? A woman sits there and lets the work of the church not run? No. She does the work that needs to be done, but she doesn't become a pastor. She does the work that needs to be done. No Bible worker, she does the Bible work work. No, no, a woman can be a Bible worker, there's nothing wrong with that. She doesn't do the work. If there's a work that a pastor does, a sermon needs to be shared, she can help share. There's no man to do it. But does that make her a pastor? No, it doesn't. Then what happens? You know what this would do? It would be a rebuke to men because it would show them they're not standing in their place. Then what happens? All of a sudden, the man, he was gone. But the man has been moved by God. He's convicted now. He recognizes that he's in apostasy. He's messed. He's left his home. He's been a fool. And the Spirit of God comes upon him, he comes home. He says, look, I've been a fool, I apologize. Please, I want to come back to the home. I want to do my duty, my responsibility. She says, no, I'm a man. Continue to make the food in the house, I'll split the wood. Is that what she says? No. You know what she says? She gladly gives him back the axe and he splits the wood. This is the way a Christian home runs. And if we understood it, it would solve the problem in the church. Success of the church depends upon home influence. Acts of the Apostle, Acts, Acts, uh, Adventist Home, page 15. Do we see, though? Do we see? That's the Bible explaining itself. One last question or so before we get ready to close. So, 
we really wanted to ask questions concerning how to study the Bible. That's the whole, this was really set up for how to study the Bible and what we studied uh, there. But I use that as an illustration of how to study the Bible uh, to, to make that meet. But we really want to ask questions concerning this. And, and what, what are they, first, what I want you to do is always grab the principle. The Bible says in Proverbs, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, with all thy getting, get what? Understanding. So when a person gives a point and they try to make it prove something, grab the understanding. So what are they saying from 2T that uh, is making them think that they're doing? What she's speaking of right now is that in Alabama today, there are two churches that are, in one church in Alabama specifically, there's another church somewhere else where they have opened up churches on Sunday and are starting to have Sunday services in the morning and uh, people are recognizing there can be some danger in this. And so others are in the uproar and so forth. The president just came to different churches. I, s I spoke with the president, in fact, of, of that conference. And he was, came to our church and we were talking with him, just Sabbath pass. And this question was talked about. But she was asking about that. That's what she's speaking of. Now, uh, what, is the, what are they saying the argument is in, in uh, 2T. Is that what the quotation says? Now, what I'm doing, I'm answering you this way, but I want you to see what I'm doing. I'm showing you how to study. Because sometimes people add something that's not in the quotation. And then they take away something that's in the quotation. Like some people have said, well, this is why it says, no bikes. And so because there's no bikes, that was for her day. And so today, some, we have to put it in context. But there's no quotation that says no bikes. There's no quotation that says that. If you read the quotation, it doesn't say that. The quotation is talking about the wrong use of money. It never says in any way that God condemns the bicycle. So you'll find out that many people use it. When I was taking the class in school, they were talking about theology and inter interpretation. They used that example. When I went to the quotation, that's not what the quotation says. But that's what we've been made to think. It says you talk to almost any seven Adventists right here in Loma Linda or around the world, and they will tell you that's what the quotation says. But that's not what the quotation says when you read it for yourself. So a question, what is, the, wh what is being said from the quotation? And this is very important. Do, do, do you see that? We don't want to add to it or take it away. Now, the first thing is to do is this. I would help a person to see a, a, a deeper spiritual issue. Because, see, what they're making it as if, and this is what the argument, some people, and they make it, they try to make you look foolish. The devil is tricky. And so what they did was they said, anybody who's against this, they're against evangelism. And they're saying that, that, that how can we be so foolish? What's wrong with doing evangelism on Sunday? We should do evangelism Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We should do evangelism every day. But the question is not evangelism. That's not the question. We should do evangelism every day. But the question is something much deeper. And let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Notice something. And what we, what we do is have to go through the history. Now, we don't have time to go through the great detail of that today. We've got to bring it to a close. This is taking us past our time now. But I want to at least get this point. And that is, uh, you're going to 1 Thessalonians 5. But if you go through the Bible, you'll find out historically... Does anybody know how Sunday worship ever came into the church? In the Christian church, when you study history, the Bible says at, that, 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 that there's nothing new other, under the sun. As it have been, so shall it be. There's nothing new under the sun. There's a principle that means history shall be what? Repeated. So if you go back through history, you'll be able to see history repeats itself. So you've got to go through how did Sunday come into the church the first time? If you go back through the first time, you'll find out that they begin to start interest in introducing services on two different days, Saturday and Sunday. Then they start loading down the burdens on Saturday and start making Sunday a day of celebration, a day of joy, a day of gladness. And it made Sunday a day of fasting, a day where everybody seemed to be sad, a day where there was so much burden and so much work, but Sunday a free day. You don't have to do anything, no way. Dress like you want. Just, just, be, just come to church just as you just enjoy that. And they did that until people began to look at Sabbath with a burden and Sunday with a joy. And the people start looking at Sunday more. For, this is history. And it's being repeated. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Bible says... Beginning in verse 23, beginning in verse 22, it says, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Verse 22 says, Abstain from what? Abstain from what? I mean, I'm in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22. What did it say? All together, it says, Abstain from what? 
all appearance of evil. Now, I want to ask you a question. Think about it now, too. And this is what people are saying. Well, the reason why they're going to church on Sunday is said because we open up this service on Sunday because the unchurched. Now, question. Why is the unchurched coming to church on Sunday? The unchurched doesn't come to church on Sunday. He's not going to church on any day. So that's not going to bring... That's not going to bring a person. That, this is the argument. They're saying Sunday. And then there's someone, another one says, well, well, this opens up as people who go to church on Sunday. But, but if the person is already going to church on Sunday, would he come to your church on Sunday or his church on Sunday? So how is that evangelism? How is opening up your church on Sunday when everybody else is in their own church on Sunday, why would he come to your church on Sunday? Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be, it would be easier for a man who has a church to come to church on a day he doesn't go to church than to come to a day when he goes to church to his own church. So that's not evangelism. So you have to look at the argument and say, is this really a good means of evangelism? And it won't even reach the Sunday goer because he's going to church on his own church on that day. It's not going to reach the one who's not going to church because he's not going to church on Sunday. Why is he going to go to that day? Someone says, well, Sunday, nobody goes to church. Well, Saturday, they're not going to church either. So Saturday will be just as good as Sunday. So that's not a, a way. Nobody's, they're not doing that. In fact, you will find out the same way most people have more vacation time on Saturday even than they do have on Sunday. So as for evangelism as a method, Saturday would actually be a better day. Uh, but your church is already open Saturday, praise God. So, but now when you look back at this, but then there's a Christian principle. The Bible says in verse 22, and I would start here to open up the person's mind and then go deeper into things that we just said. First, I would start here. The Bible says in verse 22, abstain from the appearance of evil. Now, is there an appearance of evil? If I begin to open up my church on Sunday, is it possible that some people can make it, it can make it appear to others that I'm beginning to start worship on a Sunday if the Sunday law is getting ready to be passed? Could it appear that way? Should we abstain from that appearance, yes or no? Now, the Bible actually gives a, a principle in 1 Corinthians 6 and chapter 10. I won't go there, you know it, but you can read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and it says, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Is there sin with open your church on Sunday? Is there sin? No. But is it expedient? Not necessarily. Now, the reason why, you know, when you have cooking classes, you can have cooking class on Sunday. You can do things on Sunday. So it's not that it's evil, but we ought to be careful that what we're doing does not carry the appearance of evil. Now, 1 Corinthians 10 says, well, what if what I'm doing becomes a stumbling block for somebody else? Even if it's lawful for me to do it, if I'm a Christian, what, what does the Bible say I would do? It says I wouldn't do that thing which would cause my brother to stumble. Now, what the, what the conference is saying is that so many people have written letters, so many people have uh, called them, that it's a big issue, that many people are saying this is terrible. Is it possible it can cause somebody to stumble, yes or no? So if it's not evil, would it be expedient to do that if we're Christians and following the Bible example? We would give it up. Even if it was all right, we would give it up because of the example, because we can do evangelism better. Why can't we do evangelism Sunday night? What's wrong with doing it Sunday night? Does it appear as a Sunday service? No. And someone said, well, C.D. Brooks used to always do it, and the older evangelists did it, but if you talk to him, Elder C.D. Brooks actually made a little clip, put it on, and said, no, we've never done uh, Sunday morning service. He's never done it like that, other than doing some other things in the program. His meetings were on Sunday evening, and he explained the dangers very tactfully of what could happen. So this is how we should begin, but it comes from the Bible. Amen? Let's close. D did you understand something today? Does it help us to better understand the Bible? Praise God. Now, God wants us to do this so that we can get this experience with Jesus and we can be a part of the team he's going to use to do what? Finish the work. Is it time to do that? Let us pray. Can we all kneel as we pray? Heavenly Father, we have only touched the surface of how to study the scriptures, but we see a foundation. The P stands for prayer, always pray, and never open up the Bible without prayer. The A for our attitude and purpose, a meek, humble, teachable spirit, not thinking that we know everything. The purpose of fellowship, friendship for a finished work. Comparing spiritual with spiritual, the scripture, the Bible, the law, the testimony. Looking at the context. Letting the Bible interpret and explain itself. And then the B, dear Lord, is for believing that when we pray, that you will do what you say. That when we pray, believing all things, we shall have what we ask for. We can believe that what we prayed for and understanding the word of God, that you will do it. And if we keep doing that again and again and again, P-A-C-B, P-A-C-B, every difficulty that we need to understand will be made plain as the noonday sun. And not only will we know you as a friend,
but we'll be a part of that team that's going to be used to finish the work. Please help every one of us here to put these principles into practice. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I didn't show you what that B was, but I just told you, didn't I? Yes. In Matthew 22 and verse 21, it speaks of that. Talking about this plan of it speaks of that. Education speaks of that. I'm going to pass on that. But it talks about that. How the common people need to understand this. How this, we're not going to study it now, but it talked about that in order to, if we study this way, you know, the Bible actually teaches, we don't have time to look at it, but the Bible teaches that those who study this way, that the latter rain will be poured upon them and they'll be used to finish the work. And then we can see we must do it quickly because that man of sin is, man of sin is already on the scene. And that last is B, believe. Amen. Praise God. You may consider yourself dismissed.